Hi everyone, I hope you are doing well. So in today's video, I'm actually going to go through the 2017 sample, uh, sh you know, chemistry exam, short answer questions. Like always, guys, before I start this video, if you guys want private tutoring in specialist methods, physical chemistry, you can always email me through this email. Um, and yeah, guys, we also have um, an announcement to make. We've just currently launched our website. If you guys want to check it out, it'll be in the link in the description. We are, you know, selling notes and they are very cheap. So yeah. Let's start this video. Um, question one. When making salad sandwiches, Tom prefers homemade mayonnaise on his bread, while Jita prefers a soft solid spread that is made from hydrogenated vegetable oil. Tom makes his mayonnaise with olive oil. When olive oil is metabolized, one fatty acid that is produced is linoleic acid. The skeletal structure is shown. Okay. G I don't know if I'm butchering this name. Jita's favorite vegetable oil spread is manufactured from canola oil. When canola oil is metabolized, one fatty acid that is produced is ileatic acid. Um, its skeletal structure is shown. Mm -hmm. On both skeletal structures, circle all the C to C double bonds that show a cis configuration. Okay, we want the cis to cis. Um, so C to C double bonds that show the cis configuration. Well, what is a, um, a cis? How does it look like a cis to cis configuration? First, let's look. There's only two that you need to know. There is. So there's the trans. So let's write that down. So there's the trans. And what does it look like is we have two C to C bonds. And um, well, let's say we have an R group and we have an R group here. And we have H is hard, just basic hydrogens. This is a trans because, have a look over here. Can you see how it goes like a zigzag? Can you see how the R groups um, are the same? They have to be the same. And they go for a zigzag. Even the hydrogens, can you see? They're the same molecule, so same um, atom, and they go for a zigzag. That is what a trans um, double bond looks like. And what about a cis? So a cis... It's just the opposite. So we have, cis means the same side. So we'll have, let's say an R1 here and an R1 here and two hydrogens. This is over here, as you can see, you can see how they're pretty much on the same side, the R groups. And yeah, so this is a cis configuration. It looks like this. So that's good to know. So let's apply that over here. Let's look at um, first linoleic acid actually. So let's look at the double bond. Hmm. Okay. If I'm like drawing this, so it's a C to C double bond, these two C's over here, and we have a C that goes downwards, and that's the R group. For example, we call it R1. It's this whole, whole group. And this um, also, you know, this whole group over here goes down like this. So it's, we call it R2, and then we have two hydrogens. Now this over here, is again a cis because can you see how the hydrogens are the same you know uh, atom and they are you know to each other they are close to each other they are in the same uh, plane as each other so this actual hence this double bond is a cis transformation so that's great and the other one right next to it is the same um configuration as also so we can say both of them another way you can actually just quickly know is if it's in a skeletal um, structure like this, the quickest way is you're going to have, let's say, um, the double bond like this. If they are like this, can you see how they're in the same um, same side? This over here is actually a cis. Because there, even if it's a different R group, we, accidentally, we actually have hydrogens. Remember, there is going to be some hydrogens down here, and those are in the cis... Um, you know, position. Um, what about in, you know, uh, trans? Well, the trans will look like this. Will look like this, and the other one look like this. Can you see how they're totally different? Absolutely. So yeah, that's good to know. So that we can apply that knowledge to do the question very quickly. So this over, these two over here. Sorry. So these two over here, uh, we circle them pretty much. So let's circle those. That and that are both. Um, C to C cis configuration. What about this one? Look at this double bond over here. Now, again, remember, can you see how it's going like this, like this, like this? This is a trans. So that's wrong. This is, um, yeah. 
Next question, is linoleic acid classified as an omega-3 fatty acid or an omega-6 acid, fatty acid? Well, to determine that is, okay, um, let's have a look. I want to rub this circle off, just kind of let it be highlighted much better. So, to determine if it's an omega-3 you know, or omega-6, what we do is we normally count the uh, carbons from this side because um, it's uh, that's where our functional group starts, the carboxy carboxylic acid, yeah? But no, what we do is we do the opposite. So we start from the you know back, from behind the molecule, which is over here, and we'll start counting. And we start counting all the carbons until which carbon, the, the carbon that hits the double bond, that is the number of omega. For example, let's do this. We have one here, one carbon, two, three, four, five, six. Can you see at six, it hits that double bond? This, hence, is a omega-6 um, fatty acid. So that's great. So what do we know? So we can say, let's not point that. We can say that linoleic acid is an omega-6. fatty acid. That's it. Because it's too much, you also want to show how did you get the answer? By counting, by counting backwards the six carbon is the carbon that is double bonded, that is double bonded. I hope that makes sense. Nice and easy. That's it. So that should give you the mark. Next question. Choose one of the fatty acids below by ticking the box beside it and indicate if it is saturated, monosaturated, or a polysaturated. Okay, what is a saturated? A saturated... Is it means it has only single bonds. A fatty acid that is only single bonds. And unsaturated is it has double bonds. If it's mono, unsaturated. Mono means one. It means it only has one double bond. Whereas poly means greater than one. So double bonds. So let's look at linoleic acid first. Let's have a look. So I'm looking at linoleic acid. What do we have? We have two double bonds. So what is it going to be? We know it's going to be unsaturated and we also know it's going to be poly because we have uh, more than one double bond. So it's going to be a, let's use this color, poly unsaturated. And what about il um, ileatic acid? Well, it just says take one, but I also want to do the other one. Um, ileatic acid, how about I look at it? We only have one and it is a double bond, so it is unsaturated, but it's a monosaturated because there's only one double bond. So that is a monounsaturated. Mono unsaturated. Great. Consider a triglyceride that contains three linoleic acid tails and a triglyceride that has three ileatic acid tails. Project which of the following true trig triglycerides would have a higher melting point. Okay, such a common question in an exam. Well, to determine, I'll show you. It really depends on how many double bonds uh, you have and um, what is the structure of those double bonds. Let me explain. What do I mean? If a fatty acid has a double bond that is in its cis form, a cis, we consider that as a kink and what is a kink it's it's something that's like it doesn't let it um compress it doesn't let um the close packing of molecules for example look at this these two are in its cis form and they are double bonds so, so so imagine it's like a spring just imagine this whole molecule is a spring and these things here are like you can actually push them they kind of solve because they're double bonded and that's a problem so um because linoleic acid cannot be like compressed, it cannot be packed to each other, the close packing of molecules, its, um, it's actual melting point is very low. 
So that's the problem. Whereas look at an ileatic acid. Ileatic acid here is in its, it has a double bond, but it is a trans state. Like it's, it's in that trans way. Now look at trans. It, it, look, it pretty much looks like, a, again, a nice spring that you can actually compress. So if you compress it from here, it nicely compresses. So um, of course, ileatic acid will have a higher, um, you know, melting point than linoleic acid. So remember, if there is a double bond that is in its cis form, it's going to be a kink and kinks. I don't let the actual molecule be compressed um, closely packed, which um, again creates weaker dispersion forces between those adjacent molecules and hence um, a low melting point. So let's write those. Um, I'm going to write a lot, so not a lot, but dot point um, in very detail. So uh, because I want to show you guys how the fingering process is. I know I'm taking very long, but it's more about uh, um, showing you guys how to answer questions and really explaining all the chemistry be behind it. So what we're going to say is, so for the linoleic acid, so we're going to say the presence, so we can say the presence of the cis bond in lin, um, so what was it? Linoleic, oh, it's here. Linoleic acid creates. So, what does it create? It creates a kink in the fatty acid. So, fatty acid tail, and hence it disrupts. So, hence disrupting. The close packing So the close packing of molecules This result So um, again, so this result in a less efficient in a less efficient And weaker dispersion forces. Forces between the molecules. I know this answer is very, um, you want to actually dot point it, but this right here is just one dot point that is very detailed and i just want to again write those just so you can guys read them um to look at your answers and see how you can write them nicely so another dot point we can put is now we're going to talk about aleatic acid so aleatic acid contains um a tr a trans double bond no Double bond, which allows so which allows for a more linear arrangement, pretty much. So that allows for a linear arrangement of the fatty acid tails, actually, of the fatty acid tails. So, and this linear arrangement, this linear arrangement, so this linear arrangement facilitates, so if it's, I don't know how it would, so it facilitates, close-up packing, packing of molecules. Hence, a higher, so a stronger actually, a stronger dispersion force. Stronger dispersion force. Okay, and yeah, so look what I did. So for three marks, what I did was I did, I talked about um, linoleic acid and ileatic acid for the second one. And the last one is just the statement. Uh, hence, what's going to happen, ileatic acid. has a higher melting point, has a higher melting point. 
nice and easy. Great. So I hope that is, uh, that's very easy to understand. So next question. Question two, amylase is an enzyme. Okay, if you don't know what amylase is, so amylase is uh, an enzyme in your actual uh, tongue or, and what it does is it kind of um, breaks down when you get food, it breaks down some of the food. Uh, it's an enzyme that catalyzes the hydrolysis, so the breaking down of starch and sugars into glucose. Okay, there are two models that, you know, explain how enzymes work, the lock and key and the induced fit model. Uh, I'll tell you understanding of the lock and key model. So to draw and annotate a set of simple diagrams to explain how amylase catalyzes the hydrolysis of disaccharides. So amylase, hydrolysis of disaccharides. Okay, well, the best to explain a key uh, model, uh, sorry, sorry, a lock and key model is to think of, a again, a lock and a key. So the lock is the um, enzyme and the key right there is the substrate and it goes inside, comes out, yeah. So let's actually just draw a nice detailed, um, and I'll, ex I'll explain while I'm drawing it, how the lock and key for an amylase hydrolysis or disaccharide would look like. So let's just draw a nice, um, let's draw, like, let's say a nice, like this. Actually, it's not even that nice. Sorry for that. So it's going to look like this. Looks like this. This over here um, is going to be our, let's annotate it. So this is our um, enzyme, which is enzyme, which in this case, it's our amylase. Amylase. Okay, spell. And what can we see? Well, this here inside is our um, act, uh, active site. That part here is our active site. Mm -hmm. And let's draw our substrate, in this case, which is our disaccharide. So imagine it's like a, it fits perfectly, so like this. So this is our disaccharide, and it's, um, in this case, it is our substrate. And it is, in this case, our disaccharide. Okay, perfect. So this here, what's happening is the uh, substrate, which is in, you know, the disaccharides entering the active site of the enzyme. So let's write that down here nicely, a little diagram. So what's happening is substrate enters the active site. There active site nice something like this and i'm going to make this spot so that's the first step okay that's your first step oops i want to make this very small because we're going to draw the next step and then like this okay like this and so this is here our first step what what's the next step then when the uh, substrate actually goes inside the active site, what's going to happen? There's going to be bonds formed, um, formed with the enzyme and the substrate. For example, let's talk about this, and that creates the enzyme substrate complex. So, again, so let's draw. Actually, I want to just copy the whole thing. Oops, so copy this whole diagram because so I'm going to reuse it and bring it over here. I'll break it bigger. Okay, so we have this over here. So let's look. Okay, and now as the substrate is actually inside, what's going to happen? Well, as you can see, the substrate's inside. There's going to be bonds formed with the enzyme. There's going to be some bonds forming. So imagine some bonds. There are forming bonds right here, and these bonds are going to create our enzyme comp. Um, our enzyme substrate complex. So these bonds are forming, and overall, this over here. So what can we say? Well, let's just annotate over here. So bonds are formed with enzyme to form. Um, enzyme substrate complex. There we go. So again, the substrate, again, this is still, so overall, this whole thing over here. Now, 
overall is the um, enzyme substrate complex. Okay, perfect. So yeah, can you see? This is your um, key and it's going inside the lock and now there are bonds forming. So this overall is your... Okay, let's make that the next step. So bring it over here and we'll draw a red arrow. Nice little right there. Something like that. We know what's going to happen next is, remember it is a disaccharide. So because it's going through hydrolysis, amylase is going to break it to a monosaccharide. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this again, this annotated thing. Now, the next part, what's going to happen, let's draw this, okay, is while the bonds it's going to half. The substrate is going to half because remember it is a hydrolysis. So let's draw something like this. So it still has some bonds, and now it's going to half that substrate, as you can see. And again, the bonds are still there, holding one together, one half together. Okay. And what are we? What's happening here? Well, so let's do it. bonds are breaking are breaking in the substrate in the substrate now guess what these are our monosaccharides through high road so both of them are monosaccharides nice so i don't think oh yeah i'm gonna write them actually mono um saccharides and that's it so this is what's happening and then let's bring that over here very small and the last step is they leave the enzyme complex uh, whereas the enzyme is going to be unaffected let's take this so what's going to happen is the new products are going to be formed so let's just draw those two or something like this and these are our new products so we can say new products formed formed and our enzyme is unaffected enzyme unaffected pretty much yeah that's that's the steps of it um i hope that is very easy to understand. Yeah, that's pretty much what it is. Um, I'm going to make them nice, actually, because we have all this whole space. So I think I'm just going to make this a little bit like this and take this over here. Bring it like this. Just nicely fit it in here. So in other words, we're saying that this here is our first step. Sorry, sorry. That's our third step. This over here is our fourth step. And we can actually just rub the arrows. No need for the arrows anymore. This over here is our... Well, if I maybe bring this annotation... Well, I hope you can really unsee it. I'm just going to keep them the same level and just say this is our first step. And this is our second step. I'm not going to too much waste time on that. Yeah, so this is what's happening. So arrow like that. Like this. And that goes over here. Great. And so we've applied our understanding. And yeah, that's pretty much it. So what about 2B? If instead the amylase catalyzes the hydrolysis of a disaccharide according to the induced fit model, in what ways would the interaction be different? You may, you know, use a label diagram to explain your answer. So let's actually understand. Let's use a diagram to draw it over here and we'll explain. So the induced model, what it does is, so let's say we have an enzyme. For example, let's call this enzyme. It's like, in another words, how would you describe this? Let's say... It's a box, it's a box, and um, it's like this. It goes like this, and it goes like this. Something like this, and this is your enzyme. So here is our enzyme, which in this case is our amylase. 
And so we have our substrate, of course, which is our disaccharide. So let's draw our disaccharide too. Wow, why isn't it going down? Okay, okay. So let's actually draw our disaccharide too. So, our, uh, sorry, our substrate. So which, let's say it's like a real perfect square. And it's like an arrow. So like an actual arrow. This is what, how it um, looks like. This is, this is how it looks, our um, substrate. So that is our substrate. Now, what do we know? Well, of course, this substrate is not going to go inside this um, enzyme because look at the shape of our active site. It's not going to fit. But the induced fit model is what, what, what it explains is if you put this substrate is, this will change structure to make it perfectly fit into this. So, so what's going to happen is this is our substrate. In this case, again, this we want to make sure to annotate this nicely. This here is our active site. So active site, okay? And so, let's make this little. Something like this. So that's the first step. And what's going to happen is, the next step is, as it goes down, so let's actually draw. It's gonna start forming a also, um, the, so the active start is going to be transforming to fit the substrate. So like this, like this, like this, and like this. So yeah, we will try to make it, um, its active site fit, try to fit into the, as you can see. Here we go. So. What's happening is that the enzyme changes shape slightly as this, um, as the substrate binds um, binds. So, and this here is what we call the enzyme uh, substrate complex. So again, this here is our enzyme substrate complex. And here is um, make sure what's happening is enzyme changes shape. Enzyme changes shape there we go so that's how um that's what really the induced method is and what's going to happen because remember we're still explaining it's a polysaccharide so um, after this oh it's really not it's really struggling why doesn't not let me like that okay we have this is our next step. And what's the last step? Well, not the last step. Well, um, it's in there. And now what's going to happen is it's going to um, go off now. So the last step is it's now it's going to get up. So let's redraw. It's going to look like it's original. So it's going to, again, go back to its original shape. So the enzyme's still going back to its original shape while the um, substrate's going to leave. So... Let's draw that, so it looks like this. And now we'll have two parts. So we'll have, um, looks like this, it's one. And the other part, which should look, sorry, let's look like this. This, whereas the other part would look like this. So the two parts are going to here are your products, which are both mono monosaccharides in the case of our question. And this over here is the product leaving, product leaving enzyme. Hope that, you know, well, that's pretty much the basic. This is just a little small diagram that just explains how the induced model looks like. So that's pretty much what it is. And, and this is what we're going to leave at the bottom of our page to explain how the induced method looks like. So let's do that. So what does this do overall? Well, let's put, okay. What this is doing is, let's write some stuff here. So this model, this model proposes, so he proposes um, that the shape, that the shape of the substrate, of the substrate, is not perfectly, so not 
perfectly complementary to the shape of the axis side. So to the shape of the shape of the active side. Hence, to overcome this, to overcome this, the active side, so the active side, the active site adjusts its shape. So um, adjusts its shape slightly. So it adjusts its shape to allow the substrate to bind. The substrate to bind. And then we want to still talk about when leaving, the enzyme returns to its root. So when substrate leaves, the enzyme returns, the enzyme, um, we can say it returns to its original shape, to its original shape. And there we go. That's it. Very detailed answer. But yeah, I hope that helps you guys understand that. Okay, question three. The following table lists a student summary notes about food chemistry. It contains some correct and incorrect statements. Okay. Uh, identify two correct statements by writing the statement numbers in this box. Okay, let's look at it. Question, uh, statement one. The monomies, so the basic units of starch, are bonded by glycosidic linkages. Um, and the monomies of proteins are bonded by peptide um, linkages. So the monomies of starch are bonded by... Okay, monomies of starch, starch is a sugar. So the monomies should be glycosidic linkages, which is true. So that's what they've said. And the monomies of proteins are bonded by poly polypeptide. That's great. So one looks great. You can put a tick on that. The hydrolysis of a protein... Um, requires the presence of both the enzyme and a coenzyme. No, 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 no. Yes, it may require an enzyme, but not a coenzyme, but not 100%. Some don't even need the coenzyme. So um, they've just made that little mistake by saying coenzyme, I think, here. Yeah. What about three? Um, an enzyme can only catalyze a specific biochemical reaction once, since it's consumed in... No, no, no. An enzyme is never consumed in a reaction. Just remember that. So wrong. Uh, so what about this one? It says, sucrose is a disaccharide formed by the condensation reaction between the monomers of glucose and fructose. Well, let's check. If you go to our, have a let's look at it. Where is it? Sucrose. Here's sucrose. And here is, okay, so here's sucrose. And we have glucose, sorry. Sucrose, and we have glucose here, and fructose. And what's saying is it's, a com it's both of them combined to get sucrose. Well, let's check that. Well, over here, it looks very similar to this side, and we can see that this OH is over here. That's been by that glycosidic linkage. Okay, look, so uh, this looks like a, yeah, alpha glucose over here. And what about the other one? Fructose. Yes, it, they, that's true. As you can see, this one over here is similar to this one. So it is, yeah, the combination. So by condens condensation reaction... Um, this one looks great. Sucrose is a dark form of condensation. Yeah. Uh, fats have a lower melting point than oils, but they are both classified as triglycerides. No. Um, yeah, fats and oils are both um, having a... So what do we know? Well, fats have a low melting point. Well, let's check that. Well, we don't we need to 100% check everything that we're doing. So let's go to a, to um, our thing. What do we see? Look at the he um, heat combustion of this. What can we see? Well, it takes, it needs more energy. So fats and oil. So it's both fats and oils. So if fats and oils both have the same energy content, so if fats have a lower melting point than oils, and both can no. So if they had a low melting point, fats and oils would have that low melting point. So this is wrong. This is just saying that fats and oil, so fats have lower points, whereas oils, you know, are not. Whereas yeah, they're both. They should both have that. If both have low, they both should have low melting point. If one's right. Six. When an oil is hydrolyzed, glycerol and free fatty acids are produced. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, that's true. Oxidative rancidity occurs when a saturated tri triglyceride is exposed to oxygen. 
This causes the saturated triglyceride to form compounds such as um, aldehydes and ketones. Um, it's supposed to be say unsaturated uh, triglycerides. So that's the wrong statement here. Okay, let's look at the next one. Antioxidants are reducing agents that slow down the rate of oxidative rancidity. Yes, true. Uh, the denaturations of protein is the breaking down of its secondary and tertiary structures. Okay, they're forgetting one more, also the quaternary structure. So I would say that's wrong. So zwitter so ions are ions that are produced when a protein is broken down. What the hell? No, no, that's wrong. Okay, so then just we need two correct statements. So we'll pick one on four. So the most easiest one, one on four. One, four. Identify two incorrect statements by writing the statement number in the table provided and explain why each statement is incorrect. So, okay, well, let's, again, pick the easiest. So for this kind of question, I think I will just do... Well, we'll do, so we'll do three, we'll do three, why not? So we'll do three, so we'll do three. Three looks nice because it says an enzyme only, can only catalyze a specific biochemical reaction since it's consumed. No, it's never consumed. That's, we can easily, um, uh, fix that. What else? What, we always pick the easiest one. What else? Also, nine looks nice. So the denaturation of proteins is the breaking down of secondary and tertiary structures. They have forgot quaternary structure. So that's also um, so nine. Also, is wrong. So let's write that down. So why is three wrong? Well, they have again. They've just said um, enzymes um, are never consumed. So we can say enzymes remain unchanged. Pretty much remain unchanged. And are uh, not consumed. Not uh, consumed during reactions. They only so they catalyze only. They ca um, catalyze only. So okay, that's pretty much it. That was the only wrong statement there. The enzyme can only catalyze a specific biochemical ones, and it's consumed. And wait, and someone's like, during the action. And also, because they're saying that you can only catalyze once, no, um, you can repeatedly catalyze also. They repeatedly... Okay, there's one more thing here we want to write. Um, enzymes... Allow... So enzymes repeatedly... Catalyze. Um, yeah, so enzymes repeat to catalyze. That's it. That's very nice. Nine. We were, we were talking about the denaturation of protein. They forgot the uh, tertiary structure. So we can say. So denaturation. Denaturation. Of a protein. Can also involve. Can also involve the quaternary so is that how it's for quaternary structure uh, yeah where so where they disrupt the subunits pretty much yeah denaturation of a protein can also involve the quaternary structure that's nice yeah that's that's it question four Claire is analyzing a sample of paint to determine um so Determine the organic solvents that are present. She separates the different compounds and analyzes each one using an infrared spectroscopy and uh, thetine carbon and HNMR spectroscopy. Spectros I still don't know how to say that word. Claire finds out one of the compounds that she isolates has a molecular formula of this. Okay, that's actually important because we're probably going to find what it is. The results for these compounds for each type of spectroscopy Spectroscopy used are shown in the spectra on page 18 to 20. Use the information provided to answer the questions on page 21. So, okay, what do we have? We have the IR spectrum, great. And if we go down, we have the NMR, so carbon NMR. And we also have hydrogen NMR. Okay, that's great. And we have the splitting patterns and chemical shift. Okay, so let's look at A. So it says from the uh, infrared spectrum of a compound, identify the organic family in which the compound belongs to. Justify your answer by referring to the relevant wave numbers. Okay, nice. So we just need two actually because it's two marks. So um, let's look at the 
infrared. So, okay, this is how you read an infrared spectrum. Look, we need to first locate the fingerprint region because it's always at 1,400 centimeters to the negative one. So right over here, this is part over here, is the fingerprint region. So what we do is we forget about this when we're analyzing. This here is just the idea. This what 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 is the actual uh, the fingerprint region? It is like the identity of the molecule. What we what we have the like four chemists. What they have is they have a fingerprints for every molecule. The fingerprint. Um, region for every molecule and what they do is sometimes they can easily identify some organic like uh, if it's alcohol but what is it precise is it like a um you know two methyl like methanol or something what they do is they look at and they compare the fingerprint regions to so the fingerprint ring so the fingerprint region is the identity of the um of an actual um organic yeah an organic um substance so Let's have a look at here. So we're only going to look at what's greater than 1,400, which is what? Well, the most, I think, important peaks we can see is this peak over here and this peak over here, which is what? Well, this peak over here, if I'm not mistaken, let's say it's around, say, over here. So it's around this and let's say this peak over here is around over here. So it's around mm, 3, 102. Uh, two eight hundred centimeters into the negative one. Let's so let's have a look at our um, data booklet. So we can see infrared. So we're looking at three. So three one hundred to two eighty. Okay. So what do we see? Do, do, do nothing on the light. So let's have a look over here. So two eighty. Look at this. This one looks great. Have a look at that. 2850 so we said from sorry we said from 2800 to through this which is so close to this so it will likely be a ch so this group over here is a ch um so it's an alkene okay and what about this bond over here too this one over here well let's just draw some lines so, so we're saying from over here it's likely over here and likely over here and it's a very sharp peak which is what we can say this is around 1600 to 600 700 800 so to 800 okay let's have a look at that what is that well it looks like one to two two it could be somewhere it could be an aldehyde, looks like, so 1,000 is going to do this, but nah, it's too kind of short. Um, and it wouldn't be an aldehyde. Remember, if it was an aldehyde, if it had an aldehyde, it would have had, remember, it would have had some nitrogen groups in there. So that's not true. An acid, well, it's very, it would be very, um, doesn't look like it's an acid, it's very broad, much more. A ketone? Yes, it does look all right for a ketone. A ketone is just one oxygen. So could be true. An ester group? An ester group, if it was an ester group, which is in this case not even in there, like it's not one, it's it's not even between that, it would have had um two O's. So yeah, this would likely be a ketone, as we can see. One uh 1680, which is this, to 1050. Yeah. So it's quite likely that. So this over here is a C double O. We know 100% C double, but it's probably a ketone. Okay, perfect. So it could only be an alcohol or a ketone, but we know for a fact that it's not in here. It's not that one. Um, to, for it to be an alcohol. So yeah, and an acid, yeah. So knowing those, and yeah, that's great. So let's write those down. Actually, I want to keep that there. I want to keep it to the right. So let's go to our questions. From the ion spectrum, it says, um, identify the organic chemistry in which common belongs to justify. Okay. So the first one we found is it likely is a ketone. And so we want to refer to it because it, for a ketone, we know it has to be between 1680 to 
1850 centimeters to the negative one. So it is between that. So it will likely be a, in that family. We also know, we also found that it was in the CHs, so the organic, pretty much like alkanes or alkenes or arenes, or, but it's in that C to H. Well, well actually, let's also write this. So it's a C double O. Um, it is, so C to H, so it, what do we say for C to H? Um, it probably is and, well, just from the number of, so we have 5 times 10. Say, let's say it was a ketone. It doesn't look like it has any double bonds. So CC, let's say ketone occurs here. C to C goes like that. C, um, one, two, three, four. And how many Cs do we have? We have three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, yeah, so it wouldn't have a double bond. It only has that double line C. So now even if it, if it was an alcohol, like a C to C, 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 and it's an alcohol here, which is 100% not true. So we got three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Eleven would be an eleven. So absolutely. So it could only be a single bond. So we can say it's an alkene from this pretty much. And there was no double bond, by the way. I don't think there was any double bonds in that. Um, so it would likely be an alkane, an alkane group. And because it was in that 2850 to 3090 centimeter to the negative one, which gives us C to H. Okay, nice. So we've just, you know, done two and that's it. Okay, draw a structural formula for this compound that is consistent with the data provided. Explain your answer reasoning why. So we, okay, okay. What do we know? Well, we know it has to have a C double OO and it's a CH. So let's actually draw and we, we likely think it's a ketone. Well, let's check that. Um, first, let's draw some possible values. So, and then we'll look at the um, carbon NMR and the uh, proton, so the H NMR, which will give us to, uh, will, will make us get into the ones that will be. Okay, so let's look at the first one. Well, we have, we can have a C double O here, which is, let's say ketone, we have H here. Okay, and we have, let's say, C. So we have five Cs. It could be this one over here. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we do have, yeah, this perfectly does fit a line. So we can have this arrangement, or we can have the double O into the second carbon, in this case. Something like this. So again, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. No, one, two. Oh, sorry, my apologies. I'm not supposed to have that there. Yeah, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10 so also we could have this arrangement or it could be also in the middle so it also can be in the middle that ketone mm -hmm. and that gives me three four five okay so 10 okay so we have only these three arrangements that we can actually attain so let's look at the carbon in amount to find how many what what like um what uh, carbon environments can we get? Well, we only look at, when we're looking at this, how much? We have one, two, and three. So we only have three peaks. So which of these will give us three carbon environments? Well, look at this. We have one carbon environment for this one. So one, there'll also be two, three, four, and five. So this has five, so that's not good. This one, it has one, two, Three, four, five. Also, I think this one also has five. This one over here, we have one. Because of symmetry, this has, this is also two, and this also is three. Which is by symmetry, we can see. If I'm not mistaken. So this one has three. This structure over here. That looks all right, yeah. Just by symmetry. Look, it's symmetrical along this axis. So if our symmetry, this is symmetrical to that. So we consider... This by itself one, and then these also included as one. So that is three. So that's okay. So this gives us a tick. So is it this? Well, we can. Well, let's check our um, our proton NMR. So let's take this actually. Well, let's check our proton NMR. This is actually going to help us. So we have two environments that we can have. 
So two um, environments, which is again the case. Have a look at this. This is one um, hydrogen um, environment, and this is also another hydrogen environment too. So this also gets another tick. So it is likely this. Well, one more check. We have a splitting pattern, which can actually help us. So for example, let's have a look. So in the splitting pattern, so we're using n plus one rule, we'll look at three. If we have a three here, we'll equal it to three then. So if it has three, so what's our n? n is equal to two. What, what is our value n? n is just like the next, um, what the number of carbon it's n is next to the other carbon. For example, well, n equals two. So we should have two carbon, two hydrogens, sorry, two hydrogens and then following. So for example, this has three and the next one has two. That's great. So, okay. Mm hmm And we could do the same for the other one if we use n plus one for, for this. So it will just become n equals three. Yes, also n equals three. We have three hydrogens in this one. So yeah, we have those. Okay, so I think just knowing by that, it is highly likely this ketone over here. So it does fit this ketone perfectly. Like it, both all of them actually fit that. So let's draw that structure. So what it does look like, it looks like a C, double O here. We have two C's on the left, two C's over here. And we can draw that. Draw that, we have hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen. Nicely. So that's, so we've drawn the structure and, so explain your uh, reasoning, so we'll just give the point dot points. So what it is, we found out that, um, f let's say for the H HNMR, so, so from the um, NMR, what did we found out? We found out that there are two hydrogen environments, so two high high hydrogen environments. So we found out that there was two hydrogen environments, which is in um fits our molecule. We also found out that um for the carbon NMR, we found out that there was three environments. So for the 13 carbon NMR, we had three carbon environments. Also, that helped us a lot. Okay, so we've got that and that. What else gave us? Um, and by the... Um, IR spectroscopy, so by the IR. Well, IR is just going to give us the groups, yeah. So, NMR, two hydrogen environments. We also found out that the splitting, the splitting shows three carbons attach. So the splitting, the splitting show that three carbons attach. Um, so these three carbons attach to the um, carbon. The splitting pattern shows three. No, no, three hydrogens. Actually, sorry. So three hydrogens. So it's very messy, actually. Um, three hydrogens attached. So the splitting, you know, the splitting shows three hydrogens attached um, to a two um, hydrogen carbon. So hence follows splitting pattern. Follows splitting pattern. There's actually many things you can talk. I mean, then you can also like go to your um what we call your data booklet and like look at the these points for example we have the chemical shift at one you can do that you can also talk about that yeah but i think this would be enough so to talk about we found two hydrogen three carbon environment the splitting shows that 
th well, you know, three is a, so three hydrogens are attached to two hydrogen carbon, which you know follows the pattern that we've seen in this molecule. So also, you yeah, you can do quite like if it's a very easy molecule, if it's three and you've already found out that it's all of them fit in one, so yeah, there's no need to look at this if you yeah, but it's important also to look at that for it when the let's say the molecule is very hard to understand, yeah. So that's it. That's for that one. Question five. Let's have a look at this. So as ascorbic acid, also called vitamin C, is an organic acid that plays a vital role in human health. Its molecular formula, this, uh, so citrus fruit are a common source of vitamin C. In the following experiment, the concentration of vitamin C present in the juice from a batch of freshly squeezed lemons was determined by carrying out a direct redox titration against the triiodide ion. The triiodide ion is produced with iodine solution and the iodide solution uh, solution so this are mixed together so we have that the overall the overall redox reaction is this identify the oxidizing agent titration reaction in this titration so the oxidizing agent is what it's the one that's being reduced well let's have a look at the molecules well we only have two reactants so one of them is going to be of course the um, oxidizing agent whereas the other one is going to be um the a reducing agent. So, well, let's look at the C, the citric acid. So, C six H eight O six, and it becomes this and this. So that's it down. C six H six O six plus two H plus. Well, the zero charge here and the zero charge, but there's a plus two charge, and we need to compensate. So we're going to plus two E here, and that then hence becomes zero. So because the electrons are on the right, this is goes through oxidation. So this one over here goes through oxidation, not reduction. So the next one should be reduced. So we know by just having a look at that, iodine, so iodine 3, so I3 minus AQS is our oxidizing agent. It is the one that's going to be reduced. And we can check that. So I3 minus AQS goes to what? It becomes this. So let's write that down. 3I minus AQS. Let's look at the charge here. Well, what's the fully charged? It's a negative one. Here we have negative one times three, uh, negative three. So how do we make them equal? Well, well, I have to plus two e here to make it like twice as um, you know, add um, negative to for it to become negative three, pretty much. And if I add plus two e here, it means I would have add plus two e there. Guess what? It's on the left side, so therefore it's reduced. So yeah, that that I hope that makes sense. This is a different color now. For the titration, a 20 milliliter sample, let's look at that, a 20 milliliter sample of pure lemon juice was made up to 250 with a deionized water in a 250 millimetric fast. So what we have, we've diluted it. So we're probably gonna have a dilution factor in our calculations. Then 25 milliliters of allocate. So again, allocate is the lemon juice. So we've took that um, lemon juice of the diluted lemon juice. We're transferred to a conical flask and titrated against a previously standardized this solution, okay, uh, which was light brown in color to detect the endpoint. Starch was added when the mixture became very pale brown. This starch indicator turned from deep blue to colorless at the endpoint. The average titer was this. Calculate the amount in moles of um, this over here, iodine, present in the average titer. Uh, so easy. So we want the moles. So what do we have? Well. We have the concentration, so um, so C of iodine, let me write it nicely actually, iodine 3 to the negative is what? It's 2.00 times 10 to the negative 4, that's good. What else do we have? Well, we have the average uh, titer of it, so uh, which is the volume is... Um, 15.65 times 10 to the negative 3. We want it in liters. So, yep, we have that. And hence, we just need to find the mole. Now, using the formula, you should know this formula. Uh, it's also in your formula sheet. N is equal to CV. And that's over here. If you guys don't know what I'm talking about. So, this formula is right over here. N equals CV. So, that's... Yep. So, we want to find that mole. So... So to find the mole of I3 negative, what's it going to be? It's going to, they're both going to be multiplied. So it's going to be 2.0 times 10 to the negative 4. 
times 10 to the negative 4 times 15.65 times 10 to the negative 3. And that's going to give us n of what? So your final answer. This is my calculator. So it is 2.0 times 10 to the negative 4 times 15 point 65 um, times 10 to the negative 3. That gives me this. Gives me three point. Well, be careful. We want to make sure that the significant figures are. What is the lowest significant figure? It's four in this case. So it's going to be uh, three point one three zero times ten to the power. Let me count the zeros. Sorry. One, two, one, two, three, four, five, six to the negative six um, mole. So M O L. That's your answer. Hope that is nice. So let me make it a large. So and that is your answer for that one. Next question, calculate the amount in moles of um, citric acid present in each of the 25 milliliters of allocate of diluted lemon. Um, okay, so we want a mold. So what do we have is, have a look at this. We want the moles of it. So what we're going to do is, because we have them, if we look at back to the equation, have a look at this. We have this over here. We have the moles of this. And we're just going to, because we, they are one-to-one -one ratio, as you can see. So... It tells us that the mole of it tells us that the mole of I three negative should equal to the mole of C six H eight O six. Hence they um the mole is the same. C six H eight O six, which is three point one three zero times ten to the negative six mole. That's nice and easy. Next question. Calculate the molarity, so the concentration of um, this, in the original sample of pure lemon juice. So, okay, we want the original, so we're going to use our dilution factor. And state the concentration of vitamin C in the lemon juice. Okay, so now we have our N value. And so that N value, okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the concentration of this. Now, to calculate concentration, we remember it's N equals CV. So if I want concentration, it's going to be um, C is equal to N over V. So, okay. And let's do that. So we know the number of moles of C. Sorry, so C6 HAO6, which is 3.130 times 10 to the negative 6. We also know the volume of C um, of C six H A O six, which is the, the allocate, which we said was twenty five milliliters. So twenty five times ten to the negative three. Okay, and hence it's just dividing both of them. So your concentration, right this. So your concentration of C six H eight O six is just going to be. Um, 3.130 times 10 to the negative 6 divided by 25 times 10 to the negative 3. So let's do that. <coughs> that divided by 25 times 10 to the negative 3. And that gives us overall, um, again, uh, <laughs> we want it to... Um, Four, still, we want to make sure with the ends, uh, four significant figures. So, four, 1.252 times 10 to the negative. So, 1, 2, 3, 4. Negative 4 um, molar. So, we have that. Now, we have the concentration. Now, again, this is the concentration when it's in the allocate. So, we need to look at the dilution factor. So, the dilution factor. Dilution factor is what? Well, okay, have a look at the dilution factor over here. If we had the 20 milliliters of the actual sample of lemon, so 20 milliliters, and then we diluted it to 250 milliliters, what's the ratio between them? Well, it's going to be 1, 2, so what's 20, 250 divided by 20? 12.5. The ratio is this. 12. It's a 1 to, 1 to 12.5. So... What is this concentration going to be? Sorry, what is this concentration going to be? It's going to be multiplied by that 12.5. Remember, because imagine that the concentration is very strong and then you're diluting it, so you've lowered it. 
So this is our lowered value. Again, this is our lowered value. So to get it to original suit, we're going to multiply that by 12.5. So the elution factor is 12. So hence your concentration of citric is 1.252 times 10 to the negative 4 times 12.5. I forgot to write that 5 here. Which is, um, so hence C is citric. The original is that. 12.5 times 1.252 times 84. And we get uh, two, how many significant figures? Again, I think it's all four. So 1.565 times 10 to the power. So 1, 2, 3, negative 3 um, molar. That's it. That's your final answer. <clears throat> um, so the skeletal structure of vitamin C and vitamin D are shown. Okay. So we can see that. Um, as with most organic compounds metabolized by human body, vitamins exist as a pairs of optical isomers. Only the optical isomers of vitamin C, which is shown in the skeletal structure, above occurs naturally. So what they're saying is this over here is the... Um, the optical isomer of vitamin C. What is that optical isomer? It's an enantiomer. It is, like, no, so what it is is, so we have vitamin C here. Let me just explain. So vitamin C, the normal structure, vitamin C, the normal structure. Imagine you have a mirror in the middle, and so imagine the reflection of it. So it'll be C, vitamin C. So it would be like kind of everything will be um, written like, so it'll be like N I M A T I. Um, v. So can you see how it, the mirror image is that? And so this, what's, the, what's pretty much the saying is this is the mirror image of vitamin C. So this is not, it is vitamin C, but it's the mirror image of it. So it's this over here. So it's still vitamin C, but it's the mirror image of it. And that's what it is. And remember, an enantiomer or an optical isomer, they have um, like a chiral, you know, you know car so they have chiral carbons, but guess what? They cannot be superimposed on top of each other. So that is the main um, thing you should know about um, optical isomers. So on the skill uh, structure of vitamin C, circle two chiral carbons. Okay, chiral carbons, remember? So chiral carbons is when the four, for four sites, for example, have different um, like substance. For example, let's say we have hydrogen. This one has chloride. This one has bromine. This one has iodine. Can you see how they all have different um, atoms? On that C, if they have one same, for example, let's say I had a Cl, can you see how both of them have same? This is not chiral. So a chiral has to have different atoms um, in that carbon. So that's what it is. So, okay, one hint, when you see double bonds, they never, never, ever have chirality because, remember, they need to have four bonds. If it's a double to double bond, we've kind of, yeah, there's already like one of the, we don't have, you have already taken some of the bonds. So it's not going to be this. It's not going to be that. It's not going to be this because this, um, this is oxygen. So let's have a look at this. So we have, a, so one goes up like that. Great. And it's going to be this whole thing. And then also this, that's also different. Um, also, this whole thing is different. And guess what? There's an imaginary H. So everything over here is actually different. So that molecule is chiral. This over here, let me do this. This molecule over here is a chiral, so this carbon carbon. What about this one over here? Let's try to check this one. This is totally different, so that's great. This also batch is totally different. This batch is totally different, and there's an imaginary H, remember? This is a skeleton, so we don't draw those H's. So this overall two is um, an uh, chiral carbon. That's it. Uh, next question. In humans, the enzyme known as L ascorbate. <laughs> Is that that? Yeah. So l ascorbate can break down only naturally occurring um, optical isomers of vitamin C. So the enzyme known as l oxidase can break only the naturally occurring optical isomer of vitamin C. So it can only pretty much break down this, the um, optical isomer of vitamin C. Explain why this enzyme would not break the optical, the other optical isomer. So remember, you remember how we said that there were two optical isomers? We have the original uh, vitamin C and the this one over here, which, sorry. And this one over here, which is its optical isomer. So it, this enzyme would work for this one, but it wouldn't work for the original vitamin C. And why is that? Let's think. Really. Let's just draw a diagram to actually express this. I think drawing a diagram will help a lot. 
Say we have this carbon, you know, the uh, these um, originally those carbons. Remember how we talked about optimum, optimum, oh wait, optical isomers cannot be superimposed. So let's just draw, for example, um, say this thing over here, actually, let me draw over here. Say this over here is the enzyme, yeah? And it's very specific. So it looks like this, like this, and pretty much it's like a key. And let's say we have this, um, um, for example, let's say we really have the this vitamin C, the optical isomer, which actually fits into it. So it'll fit into it. For example, it will have like a, you know, this will go down here nicely. Um, we have an oxygen, we have a triangle, and then let's say we have a star. So this over here actually nicely fits into it. If you bring it down here, it's going to fit into that um, active site of the enzyme and then the reaction will happen. But imagine the optical isomer of it. So remember, draw a mirror image and let's see reflecting it. So what's going to happen? Remember, let's say this is still the same because it's mad reflected. Now, but guess what's going to happen? The this is going to be here. This is still going to be here. This is going to be here. And we are still using the same, do you remember? This is the same enzyme. Is it going to fit now? Absolutely not. Look at this. It's not going to go in the circle, and this is not going to go there. So you see why they actually don't actually superimpose to each other. This is why um, the other optical isomer that wouldn't actually, the enzyme wouldn't break it because it doesn't actually go inside the active site. It doesn't even initiate it. So I hope that's a great explanation that can, yeah. So let's write down some stuff. So two marks. So I mean, you would, I would say just draw the, pretty much bring this over here. And yeah, bring it over here, down here. Make it very small. I think it's a nice thing to put over here and let's write some stuff. So what do we say? We'll just give one. So optical, we know that optical um, isomers have um, chiral compounds. So it's that C's. So optical isomers have um, chiral compounds that, that are mirror images to each other. So that are mirror images of each other, but cannot be super inputs, but cannot be super imposed onto each other. Yeah, so you simply imposed. Yeah, pretty much that's it. And we've drawn the diagram nicely. I hope that little bit explains it much easier why they, the enzyme wouldn't break the other optical isomer. Yeah. And let's go to the next, que <laughs> next question. So the next question says, um, hmm, you feel that? I want to make sure. Is it enough to write for II or is, do we have to write more? Mm. Uh, I, I mean, the main thing is, I hope you guys understand it, but yeah, just write like an extra dot point saying like, you know, um, the three-dimensional shape, as you can see, the three-dimensional three arrangement of the amino acids residues in the active side do not fit with the optical isomer. So, you know, whatever you guys want to, yeah. But I just wanted to explain in detail how um, to understand the question. Next question, the analysis of lemon juice in part B uh, was possible because vitamin C is water soluble. In terms of its structure, explain why vitamin C is water soluble while vitamin D is not. Very, very basic, look at this. Look at this, look at vitamin D. It has this, okay, whenever, I always tell students, when you see oxygen, nitrogen, uh, fluorine, remember those, whenever you see those, they, it creates polarity. So it creates, um, you know, water like and stuff. For example, here, look at this. Here we have oxygen, so that's great. So this here little part is polar, whereas look at this whole thing over here. This is all non-polar. So what it is, uh, most of vitamin D is actually non-polar. A highly vitamin D is non-polar. Whereas look at this one over here. Okay, we have ox um, we have an alcohol group, uh, sorry, oxygen, oxygen, uh, oxygen, oxygen, oxygen. So most of vitamin C is filled with oxygen. So what's going to happen is that we can, we can actually get um, hydrogen bonding occurring. So. I f yeah, that, that's what I always, so it's all about hydrogen bonding for solubility. So, so we only want two um, dot points. So we want to talk about, okay, so we're going to talk about vitamin C. We know that vitamin C is highly polar. So it is highly polar due to the 
we said the um, hydroxyl, so remember the OH is the alcohol, so we can say high well, so hydroxyl, so hydroxyl uh, groups, which can um, which can create hydrogen bonding, which can create hydrogen bonds with water, with water. Hence water soluble hence water soluble hope that's easy next one we're going to talk about vitamin d well vitamin so vitamin d uh three actually d3 is not so wait vitamin d only contains one we said that, yep yeah it just contains one hydroxyl group and has a large nonpolar hydrocarbon structure hydrocarbon structure hence not water soluble I hope that makes sense. Just two marks. Very easy. Talk about hydrogen bonding in that. Question six. The gly glycemic, <laughs> glycemic index, GI, is a value assigned to foods based on how slowly or quickly the carbohydrates in foods are broken down to cause an increase in blood sugar levels. The GI of pure pure glucose is assigned a value of 100. Foods may be classified as having a low, medium, or high GI according to these values given in the table. So what we see is... For it to be considered low GI, we know that it has to have a value that is less or equal to 55. Medium is that and that. Okay. Carbon, let's read this. Wow, it's a lot of writing. Whoa. Carbohydrates with low GIs are more slowly digested, ab absorb metabolites, and cause a lower and slower rise in blood glucose level than carbohydrates with high GI values. In 2006, a research team at Tufts University undertook a study to determine whether a GI values are more accurate and reproducible. 63 volunteers were recruited for the study that involved six testing sessions over 12 weeks. Each session involved the volunteers randomly being given a food sample of white bread. So we have white bread, um, a simple carbohydrate that was used to test the food, or, or a glucose drink as a reference to control. Okay. Each food sample contains 50 grams of available carbohydrates. Blood glucose levels were measured at multiple points for five hours after eating the GI value and was calculated using standard formulas. The team found that the mean GI value for white bread for the study population was 62, placing it in the category of foods with a medium GI. Yes, because it's between 56 and 69, yep. Yeah. Um, however, deviations assign 15 points of either direction, effectively placing bread with all three categories so what's happened is so the mean is 62 but it's like plus or negative so we get so we have 62 plus or negative 15 so it could be both sides so if it's 62 plus 15 we get a high glycemic or low uh, which is um, low glycemic but also medium because it's in between that 62 so that's a problem uh, placing white bread in all three gi categories the team found that the variations in gi values um, differed across individuals as well as within the same individual between trials, but biological factors such as gender, body index, and physical activity had only a minor effect on the variability of GI value. So that's a problem. The team found that the variation in GI values differed across all individuals with the same individual between trials. Okay, let's look at the questions. Uh, why is glucose used as a standard for determining GI levels? Very easy. Again, glycemic index, or so GI shows how quickly carbs break into glucose remember so what does pure glucose do it's like a standard so pure glucose does not break down remember pure glucose is just glucose so when you let's say for example you're taking bread and bread is you know like polysaccharides so when your body's eating it it's going to break it down and we're measuring how fast your body breaks it down and that's your glycemic index but glucose is already a monomy it's like the most basic unit so what it just do is it doesn't break down it just it helps set a baseline for seeing how different foods affect, like, yeah, how different foods affect blood sugar levels. So, for example, let's say 
some guy, let's say a, a person, person one. I don't know, he had like, I don't know, let's say, let's make it like a 20%, or let's say like 20, he had like 20, um, let's say that we were drawing a graph actually. And let's say we had to make sure we had to create a standard. For example, let's say the standard was 40. Um, I don't know what you measure glycidic index, but let's say we measured it to uh, 40. So this over here, let's say, they all get a drink of glucose and um, this will will bring um, their blood sugar. For example, some 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 guy, let's say a, a young guy has um, 20 initially, and whereas an old guy has like 10. Well, what they're going to do is they're going to give them proportions of um, glucose to, um, so they can bring them all to 40. They can all bring them to 40, the same level. And so all the tests don't have uh, variations. And that's what it is. It's a standard. So I hope that makes sense. I know it's a very hard to understand that, but yeah. So let's write that down. So what do we say? Well, so um, so we know that GI, so we can say that GI, let me just write it down. So, okay. Okay, so GI, uh, so we can say GI shows how quickly, shows how quickly, so it shows how quickly carbs break down. So break into glucose, actually, into glucose. So drinking pure glucose um, does not, so it does not uh, break down. Of course, because it's the basic unit, break down. Hence, hence, um, it helps create a baseline. Hence, it helps create a baseline. A baseline for seeing, so for seeing how different foods, how different foods um, affect blood sugar. So different foods affect blood sugar. Hope that makes sense. Okay. Next question. What is meant by the term available carbohydrate? So the available carbohydrate is like, it pretty much refers to the proportion of carbohydrates in the food that can be digested and absorbed, that pretty much contribute to the body's energy needs. For example, when you eat food, for example, when you actually eat food, not all of the carbs, so not all of the carbs you're going to be using. It's some are going to be stored and some are going to be, um, going to be used. And the ones that are going to be used are your available carbs. And that, those are the ones that quickly get digested and absorbed for your body's energy needs. So I hope that makes sense. Whereas the other ones are going to be stored. So, you know, fruit, you know, glucogen and that stuff. So it's going to be stored in your body. So not, remember all carbohydrates, not all carbohydrates get broken down. Some get, you know, stored, whereas some um, that are not stored and sure we're breaking down, are they called available carbohydrates. Those are the ones that are available to really be broken down. So it is the proportion proportion of carbs you want to write at carbohydrates actually but carbs i'm just being lazy in so proportion of carbs um in foods uh that can be digested that can be digested and absorbed absorb that contribute, that contribute, that contribute to the body's energy needs. The body's energy needs. That makes sense. Next uh, question. Glucose is used as a main fuel by the brain and the nervous system, and it's, preferred, it's the preferred source of fuel for the most organs and muscles during exercise. Suggest why athletes may prefer to include Foods with a high GI value in their diet. Now, of course, of course, of course, you may see, see like, uh, you may see, like, I don't know, you saying Bolt eat like a, I don't know, Snickers bar because before a run. Why is it that? Because remember, sugary foods or uh, we call them high, um, high GI foods. Th when you eat them, they break down quickly into glucose, so they can give you energy, so they can give the um, athlete energy quickly for the run or something. So. Um, High GI value foods, again, high GI values really quickly release energy. That's the main advantage that athletes eat them. 
for example, when you get a sugar rush, like, you know, when you eat so much sugar or and stomach and you get sugar rush, that's what is hel- um, because of the GI value. GI values of sugar, um, snacks or, you know, I have a high GI value, so they can be, they break down quickly. So, yeah, that's why um, pretty much they consume it, athlete consume it, because it's, it, it's very helpful for exercise and helps them sustain, you know, by always providing glucose to their muscles and organs for, because they're athletes. I mean, they have to do some work, you know. Um, yeah, so I hope that makes sense. So let's write, so only two, okay, let's just write. So we can say, okay, we know that high, so let's write that down, so high GI foods are rapidly converted into glucose. That's true. Leading to a quick energy release. This can be advantages. So advantage, so advantageous, sorry, advantageous, advantageous to athletes as consuming high GI foods before, for example, before workout or you know, runs or before um, or during exercise helps sustain them. So we can say helps, helps, so it helps sustain performance, performance by providing rapid supply of glucose. Rapid supply of glucose. That's a lot of writing I've done. Yeah, but I hope you understand. And that, you know, rapid supply can be helped to, you know, the rapid supply can help them in their muscles and organs. It helps them, you know, heal quick and stuff. So high. that's pretty much why. Uh, with reference to the findings of the study, comment on food label claims that a product has low GI foods. So for example, if you look at a... Um, a, a for example, this experiment. What it's telling us that when you look at a GI, let's say you look at cereal and it says high G, uh, let's say a low GI, for example. Now, that's not a hundred percent sure. I think they should put a caution because from this experiment we found out that for every individual it's different. So for individuals, yes, they had all a control group, but for individuals, some had a high GI group, some for them had low, and some had medium. So a hundred percent. That GI value is not 100% um, sure. It depends on the person. So because of the variability, as we show, you know, that plus or negative 15, it really is a problem. So I think we can talk about, um, they cannot, so I think when they put these stuff in our products, they, they shouldn't actually, it's not consistent or it's not precise. It's only a, like a claim, I think, and they should put a caution, I think. So let's talk about something like that. And that is the best with reference to the common and the food labels. Okay. Yeah, so from this, we know that low GI foods is not 100%. So we can say that given variability, that plus or negative 15, we know um, pretty much, so given variability, it highlights, we can say it highlights. So this, it highlights the challenge. This highlights the challenge in making precise claims about GI values. Hence, food label, food label claim, so we say food label claim, so the food label claim should put a caution so like so for th- so wait so hence food label claim claims that a product so for example that a product has low GI has low GI for example this one um value should be should be interpreted with caution pretty much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it. Uh, question seven. A car manufacturer is planning to sell a hybrid car powered by a 
type of a hydrogen fuel cell connected to a nickel metal hydride, this battery. A represented of a um, hydrogen fuel cell is shown. Okay, this is nice. The overall reaction is this. Uh, on the diagram above, indicate the polarity of the anode and the cathode in the circle A and B, and identify the product of the reaction in box C. Okay, let me just tell you. Whenever you see a fuel cell and there is hydrogen being pumped in, anytime hydrogen, this is a this is every time. Whenever you see hydrogen, uh, sorry, not hydrogen. Whenever you see oxygen, I mean, whenever you see oxygen being pumped in, it will be always pumped. It will always be pumped on the cathode. It will always a hundred percent. Um, be pumped in a cathode only for fuel cells. So whenever you see, um, for example, some big like this, and then you see oxygen, just remember oxygen, cathode, straight away. And we know that the cathode, because we are treating this as a galvanic cell, remember fuel cells, are, it's like a galvanic cell. And so what are we going to do? Well, the cathode would be a positive, of course. This part would be, let me write it nicely, so. This part would be positive, and hence the anode will be negative. And so what is the product? Well, the product, of course, is Hydro, you know, H2O, it's water that comes out. So we can write H2O. Nice. Is that it? Perfect. Um, oh, so we've done that. No coughing circle. And divide the product of the reaction. It's water. Only, so remember, in the hydrogen fuel cell, which is the most commonly used, water, it, it is so, if it, it's so good because water is actually the byproduct of all of this. So it's very good. Write an equation for the reaction that occurs at the cathode. When the switch is closed, cathode reaction as well. Okay, so we need to have a look at our electrochemical series. So we are pumping oxygen gas. Let's look at our electrochemical series. And remember, it is reductant. It's in. Um, it's a. In this case, it's been reduced. So reduced. Remember, it's this way. It's going to be on this side. We're going to be looking at this side. So. Um, oxygen. Remember. So have a look at this one over here. Hmm, this one looks great because we, we're having oxygen and it results with water. That's good. Let's see. Is that it? Is that like the only one that looks nice? This one that's highlighted? What else? We also have this, but we need water. No. Remember, the byproduct is water. So that's not a great one. And pretty much that's it. So that is pretty much your cathode reaction. Remember, cathode is reduction. So let's write that down. So when you put... O2 gas plus 4H plus AQS plus 4E goes to 2H2O liquid. Nice, one mark. Let's look at, where is it? Okay, here. So it says, give one advantage of using a hydrogen fuel cell to supply energy rather than using a petrol which is uh, made from crude oil. Why? Of course, this is so basic. Remember, there's so many reasons why you should use a fuel cell. The pi product, the, well, let's look at the basics. So the pi product is H2O. It's not gases. Well, if you use a, um, for example, petrol, the pi product is going to be CO2. And CO2 is a greenhouse gas. So that's not going to be good for the environment. So hence, hydrogen gas, so hydrogen fuel cells is very good for the environment because it's creating water. The byproduct is water. Uh, and it's not affecting the greenhouse. It's not a greenhouse gas. Whereas um, we can talk about, you know, um, the petrol creates um, greenhouse gases. So let's just write something basic like that. It's only one mark. Let me say a dot point and say, um, so the byproduct of a hydrogen fuel cell is water. So it is H2O, that's right, H2O. Um, yep, whereas, so whereas, so whereas using petrol, using petrol, um, from crude oil, we're not gonna write that, so byproduct is what? Byproduct of that, byproduct that um, is, sorry, the uh, byproduct of hydrogen fuel cell is H2O, whereas using petrol, byproduct is um, CO2, which is a greenhouse gas. Greenhouse gas and is bad for the environment and is bad for the environment. Nice and easy. 
All right, that's it. What about B? The storage battery, so the storage battery to be used in a hybrid car comprises a series of these cells. MH represents the metal hydride alloy that is used um, as one electrode. The other electrodes contain nickel oxide, hydroxide, this, the electrode in aqueous solution is KOH. The simplified equation for the reaction at the anode while recharging. So it's anode, remember anode, it's going to be oxidation. So oxidation. Because it's recharging, normally the anode, when it's discharging, it's negative. So in this case, it's going to be a positive. And the simplified equation for the reaction at the cathode while recharging, so the reducing reduction will be a negative in this case. What is the overall reaction for the discharge? So one of the best way is, again, add these together and uh, then reverse them. Because remember, if you add them together, we're going to get the overall for the recharge. So just then do the opposite with them. So what's going to happen is if we add them, these will cancel out. These OHs cancel out. These water also cancel out. And then imagine like drawing, writing these first from the opposite way because that's going to create our discharge. So it's going to be Ni... OOHS plus MHS, that's going to give us NIOH squared S plus MS. Nice, that's it. In the above um, boxes on the diagram above, indicate which is the MH electrode and which one is the NIOH electrode. Okay, so. So what do we know? Oxidation is going to be the positive one in this case, remember? So here is the positive charge and it is um, oxidation. Wait, can you be careful? Wait, wait, wait. So in the box, says, well, which one, which one? yeah, so you can see that it's the positive. So oxidation is positive. So it'll be this one, which in this case is this reaction over here. It's going to be this. Um, um, actually, it's going to be this. Be careful. Wait, wait. There's a reaction of this. And it goes through that, so it's that and that that create that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the simple part, so we get this pretty much those. So write these over here. So because this one's are uh, positive, and so it's this one, so let's write that down. And I OH2 solid, and the next one would be this one. For the negative, because that's reducing, so MS positive. Pretty much that's it, yeah. So plus or minus. Yeah. In the boxes above, indicate which electrode and which is this electrode. Okay. In the bold box, provide above the um, above the cell diagram, use an arrow right or left to indicate the direction of the electron flow as the cell is discharging. Remember? Okay. This here, we're taking it as recharging. So remember, recharging just goes from positive to negative. So it goes to the right. But because it's discharging, it's going to be the opposite. It's going from negative to positive. So it's going to go this way. It's going to the left. Yep, so we just draw an arrow and left. Okay. The battery discharged for 60 minutes. So producing a current of 1.15 amps. What is the mass? In grams of NiOH would be used during this um, this period, so we want the mass. So we're trying to find the mass of NiOH. Mm -hmm. That's what we're trying to find. And guess what information we have? Well, we have the time, which is sixty minutes. So again, we want to make sure it's in seconds. That's our calculation. Sixty times sixty, we get three six seconds, and we have the current also is one point one five amps. All right, so let's use our formulas. Like, what formula should we use here? Have a look at the formula sheet. Okay, what relation can we bring? Well, these two are our favorite here. That will help us with this question over here. So let's write those down. So we have Q, so the charge is equal to I times, so it's yes, and the N of E, this is Q over F. That's it. Um, so we have those over here. So what we can do is, if we multiply both of them, remember, um, 
so the current times the time will give us the charge and the charge we will have and we divide it by Faraday which is a constant and that'll give us the number of moles of electrons and we know the whole equation of this don't we because remember if we look at over here it's this half equation of this and what do we see they are both one-to-one -one ratio so in other words we know also that the mole of NiOOH is going to be the same as the number of mole of E minus U electron. That's good. So let's try to find, multiply them together to get the charge. So the charge is going to be um, 3600 times 1.15, which is that times 1.15. That gives me 4140. And what I'm going to do is to get the number... No, no, the mole of electrons is going to be that divided by Faraday, uh, which constant, so which is in your formula sheet. So Faraday's constant is this one over here. Let's write that down. 96500. Zero, zero. Okay. So that overall would give me so 96500, it'll give us the number of, um, so, well, I've got it, it's 0 0.4, but I'm just going to write it as the number of, remember, they are equal. So I'm just going to write the number of NiOOH is 0 0.0429 more. Hence, what's the mass? It's going to be of NiOOH, which is going to be the mole, which is, 0 0.0429 divided by the molar mass, which is what? So let's do that in my calculator. What's the molar mass? We'll look at our... Um, so what's night N, Ni? Nickel. So what's the molar mass of that? Nickel, 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 nickel looks... 58.7. So it's going to be 58.7. We have 1. So 58.7 uh, plus 16 times 2, we have 2 oxygens, plus 100, running it all together, enter, and we get overall answer. Let me just drop this. I've already done the dividing yet. We get an overall answer of how many? Two, three significant figures. That's the lowest we use in our calculation, I think so. No, 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 two, actually, just two. That's the lowest, 60. Yeah, so two significant figures, so it'll be... 4.7 times 10 to the power of 1, 2, 3, 4. Negative 4 um, grams, pretty much. That is your mass. Is that right? So 4.7 times 10 to the power of negative 4. Great. I hope that's great. I hope that's right. Next question. Question 8. Carbon monoxide, CO, reacts with ammonia to produce highly toxic hydrogen cyanide, HCN, as well as carbon dioxide and hydrogen, hydrogen gas. So um, the reaction is endothermic. Okay, that's good to know. And the equation for the reaction is shown. Okay, so it's this. Write an expression for the equilibrium constant. Nice and easy. So, KC, what are the products first? So what are the products? Well, we have, these are our products. So the first product is HCN, and what's the coefficient? It's 1, so it's going to be to the power of 1, which is nothing. Um, CO2 to the power of nothing, and H2. Great. And that's going to be divided by the reactants. So, for example, the CO here has a coefficient of 2, so it's going to be squared. So CO squared and uh, NH3 nothing. That's your KC. In one experiment, a mixture of CO and NH3 NH3 together with a suitable catalyst was injected to a sealed 100 milliliter gas syringe and allowed to come to, to equilibrium. So when the equilibrium mixture was analyzed at a particular temperature, the following concentration were determined. So, okay. And these are your values at equilibrium. Great. Calculate the equilibrium cost for this reaction at this temperature. Okay, so, well, we have HCN, CO and NH3, but we don't have the other one. So we're going to use a, probably an ice table here. So so let's write the reaction. So we're going to write 2CO plus NH3 goes to 
HCN plus CO2 plus H2. And we're going to write ice. So ice is the initial. Well, of course, initially this will have zero because they're the products. They, they're initially, they won't have anything. And we don't know what initially we have here. Well, the change is, well, remember, these are going to be formed. And what is the ratios? Well, it has one, one, one in front of them. So it'll be just positive x, so just x, x, x. Whereas this one will, have, because it will be lost, and uh, the mole ratio is just uh, one. So it'll be negative x, and this will be negative 2x. What else? And we have the equilibrium over here, and that is the concentrations of equilibrium, but we want it in moles. Everything here is in moles, by the way. So what I'm going to do is, because we have the um, the volume, if we remember, so we want moles, so n is equal, I'm not mistaken, sorry. So n is equal to um, CV. So if I want the mole, it's going to be, am I... Is there any, wait, <laughs> let me have a look at the, is there n equals CV? Yeah, I think so. N is equal to CV, yeah. So, concentration, so, um, concentration, um, so if we want the mold, it's going to be concentration times the volume. So, this multiplied by zero, uh, 100 times 10 to the negative 3. So, let's, so, so what's 0 0.0025 times, um, 100 times 10 to the negative 3, that gives me 4 CO 0 0.00025, okay, and for the NH3, let's do it again, so 0 0.00125 times um, 100 times 10 to the negative 3, that gives me 0 0.000, 1, 2, 5. Okay. And we also have HCN. Well, I want to actually make these into... Make my life easier. 2.5. Let's write them in sin figures. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 4. I'm bringing this over here. Also, this one too. So, 1.25 times 10 to the power of 1, 2. So, 1, 2, 3, 4. Also that over here. So HCN is again, so for HCN, it's just 0 0.0042. Um, so times the 100 times 10 to the negative 3. Again, same as the other one. So um, 4.2 times 10 to the power of 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 4. Okay, so I think that will be enough because what we can do is we know the addition of these two should result with this and we can find that value of x. So imagine we're saying 0 plus x, which is just x, x equals this. So we know our x value now. x is just equal to 4.2 times 10 to the power of negative 14. That's great. So if we know this over here already, we already know this, we already know this. So it means the other values, so 0 plus x will give us the equilibrium, is just going to be just x, which is these. So, great. Pretty much telling us that, in another words, that, yeah, the concentration, because the mole ratio, sorry, the mole ratios are the same, it means the concentration will be the same too. So, um, it's also, so it's telling us that HCN is just equal to the concentration of also CO2, which is also equal the same as H2. That's good to know. And then we just put them all into our, um, over here. So remember, this is, be careful. Remember, we these are moles. So we want to make sure they're back to, we're using these over here. So using KC, so KC would be all of these, which in this case are all equal to each other, which is just the value of, um, of HCN, which is 0 0.0042, because there's three of them, it's going to be to the power of three, all divided by CO squared, so 0 0.0025 squared times NH3, which is 0 0.00125. That's a lot of calculations, so KC is what? I think it just took too long doing this, so... Mm -hmm. So your final answer is going to be so 0 0.0042 to the power of 3 
0 0.0025 squared, 0 0.00125. And that overall gives me, to two significant figures, so all in two significant figures, 9.5. I hope that makes sense. <clears throat> Analysts then investigated the effects of two different changes on the equilibrium system by monitoring the amount of HCN in moles present in the gas mixture over a period of time. Tick the appropriate box in the table below to show the expected effects of the amount of HCN in moles present in the gas mixture as a result of each change. Okay, so we're probably going to apply some you know, changes to the environment and that is, we're going to use the channelist principle. I call it the channelist, but I think, yeah, I think that's how you say it probably. <laughs> so let's do this. Um, so the first one is half the volume of the gas mixture, keeping the temperature constant. Remember, okay, if we're half in the volume, we are doubling the pressure. We are doubling that pressure. So let's come here. Okay, so if I'm having a look at this reaction, the way we determine which pathway will, it will go is, for example, imagine the pressure is high and what by the channel's principle we want to compensate for that we're like oh it's too much too too high we need to decrease that pressure so what it's going to do it's going to move to the direction of the number of moles that it's the lowest for example here we have two plus one so we have three moles on the left in the reactants and we have one two three we have three over here both have three on the side meaning that it's not going to move in either side so in other words there's no change there is no change for that one. So no effect for this one because the moles are equal on both sides. Next question. Um, return the volume of the gas mixture to 100 milliliters and then in, in, inject some powdered palladium into the gas syringe. Palladium absorbs H2 gas onto its surface. So if it absorbs, it's decreasing H2. So what in other words we're saying is, have a look at this. What we've done is we've decreased the H2 gas. If we're decreasing, what the system's gonna do is by the channel's primer, is it's gonna be like, wait, 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 we need it. I'm de you know, H2 is decreasing. So what we're gonna do is we need to increase it. For we need to compensate for that. So what it's to do that, it's gonna move to the right so it can create more H2. So if it's going to the right, what's going to happen to HCN? It's gonna be more, there's gonna be more HCN being created. So for that one, the effect of HCN amount of moles, it will be um, increasing. If that is, yeah, that's it. Compare the concentration time graph of the axis provided below to show what will happen um, to the concentration of HCN and NH3 in an equilibrium mixture when the volume of the gas mixture is suddenly halved at a constant temperature. Remember what happens? When we halved it, um, it didn't move on either sides, meaning that pretty much. So let's really understand this. Imagine we have this pressure. Let's say we have a container. I don't know, let's say we have this container and, I don't know, all these molecules are together. And they'd be like, oh, they're, they're, they're hitting around the table, the thing. And we're like, hey, hey, we're going to half that container. And remember, there's still the same molecules. And guess what? Now, there is, um, look, if you look at this over here, what is the concentration? Well, the concentration for this is, let's say, 20, in this case, 20 mol. And if we look at this now, can remember the volume's lower, and can you see how it's more concentrated? It still have the same amount of, um, you know, molecules. So what's happened to it? It's doubled. We got forty moles. So what's happening is the concentration of the whole system. So all of the products have it doubled. So knowing that, that's good to know. So when we talk about concentration, so let's look at the HCN. H also everything. Remember all the products, so all the reactants and the products, because it didn't go on either side. So, um, so what we're going to have is, okay, so HCN, which is on what side? Yeah, so for HCN, what's going to happen is um, it started in equilibrium. Where was HCN? 0 0.42, which, oh, they have already drawn for us, as you can see, yeah, 0 0.42 here. So it starts over here. And what's going to happen is, remember, it doubles. So, so 0 0.42 doubling that, it's going to be 0 0.84, which is over here is that right is it go by twos yes it does go by twos if i'm not mistaken so if i was just drawing this like this and then this thing will go up it'll go like um vertically upwards remember vertically upwards because everything has just increased and then it's going to move and go straight like that that's it 
because of the mole. Yeah, that's how the thing will look. And what about the NH3? Same thing. So it starts off with how much? So we said N NH3. Zero point, oh, oops, so 0 0.125. So we have 0 0.125. 0, 0 0.0125, of course. And we double that, so we're going to get 0 0.0... Um, 250. So, where is that? Mm. Two foot here. That's where the 50 sign is. Imagine drawing a halfway bit. So, this is, let's say this is that. It's going to go straight horizontally upwards and move to the right. And then we can rub this part over here. And that's how it is. Both will look like this. Nice. Next question, so CO gas, so, you know, carbon monoxide is produced when a hydrogen fuel, such as butane, C4H10, is burnt in a limited supply. When we burn or combust something in a limited supply, we there is going to be, any time you hit limited supply, it is an incomplete combustion. We're going to um, have an incomplete combustion. Write a balanced equation for the combustion of this in a limited air supply, assuming that CO is the only carbon-based oxidation um, product. Remember, so we're doing a limited supply, so um, an incomplete reaction is going to happen, so... Um, which therefore the byproduct is going to be carbon monoxide. So it'll be C4, H10, plus oxygen gas, of course. That's all going to go to um, CO, carbon monoxide, plus H2O. Now, okay, we know butane is gas um, in, uh, you know, in normal, and also O2 is gas, CO is also gas, and H2O is going to be steam, so it's going to be gassed. And, okay... Well, we have four carbons here, so we're going to put four here. We need to balance it. And how many hydrogens? We have ten, so we're going to put five here. So we just need to... So we have five here, oxygen's four, but they are odd. So what we're going to do is we're going to put twice that. Let's rub everything out again. Let's rub this, rub this, and redo this whole thing. Because, yeah. So now we have um, eight carbons, so we're going to put eight on the right. Uh, 10 here, so we have 20, 20, and then, so we have 10 here now, oxygens, and we also plus 8, so we have 9, so we put a 9 here. That's it. So that is a balanced equation. Nice and easy. Next question. CO, put, so carbon monoxide poisoning is one danger faced by rescuers entering a uh, burning building. Okay, so it's essential that rescuers wear a appropriate breathing asp um, apparatus. So hemoglobin in red blood cells take up O2, from the air in an equilibrium reaction represented by this. Okay, makes sense. So we have hemoglobin, and when it's mixed with oxygen gas, we're going to have a hemoglobin oxygen complex. So CO molecules can also attach to the hemoglobin uh, molecules. The equilibrium reaction involvement is represented by this. So when you have carbon monoxide, it's, it also does the same thing as oxygen, and now this is a hemoglobin carbon monoxide complex. So if the concentration of CO in the air inside a burning building increases to 800 parts per million, very, very small, anyone who exposed to this will quickly lose consciousness, even if the oxygen is present to revive them, they must be given pure oxygen. So it's for to revive them, they must be given pure oxygen. What conclusions can be made about the relative values of the equilibrium constants K1 and K2? Okay, they've given us a lot of information here. So what they've said that, imagine... So parts per million is a very small value. So what they're saying is, um, when you go inside a burning building, and let's say you're inside a burning building, and straight away when you go inside the burning building, you will faint if it's, like, you know, if it increases to 800 parts per million. What does that tell you? It tells us that that hemoglobin has a higher affinity for carbon monoxide. So it means it loves to bind with uh, carbon monoxide. That's why, for example, um, you know, you... you uh, if you go in that inside building and you sniff, like you sniff that carbon monoxide, what happens is the carbon monoxide increases. And for compensation of that, it's going to turn to the right. It's like, oh, hey, I need to decrease the reactant. So I'm going to, you know, go to the right. And what does that do? It creates a hemoglobin carbon monoxide complex, which is not what we want. So in other words, we know carbon monoxide has a higher affinity for hemoglobin than CO. Um, so for example, if you had the same amount of carbon monoxide and you had, so let's say you had 20, let's say liters of carbon monoxide and you have 20 uh, liters of oxygen gas and you give them, you uh, put them together and you throw it, throw it at someone. It's all fit. Yeah. If you throw it at someone, guess what? 
he'll straight away get carbon monoxide um, poisoning because carbon monoxide will straight away bind to the hemoglobin. It's much stronger. It loves to bind with the hemoglobin. That's what we're pretty much saying. So if, in this case, we need to compare the equilibrium constant, what does that tell us? Well, if the equilibrium constants tell us in terms of affinity, if the it tells us that, of course, K2 is going to be greater than K1, it means that the equilibrium, so if you write K2, K2 is just Hb for, like, it, it's the product, so in, it's the product divided by this here, so reactants, for all of them. Now, guess what? When Remember when we said if we increase this, it's going to go to the right, so what's going to happen? The concentration of hemoglobin carbon monoxide will increase, so the K2, of course, will um, will increase. But of course, K2 is going to be greater than K1 because of the affinity. Uh, K2 loves to bind with um, carbon monoxide more than uh, oxygen gas. So what can we say? Well, we can say that, okay, K2 is greater than K1. And so it suggests, what does it suggest? So we can say it suggests that the equilibrium position for the reaction, so it suggests that the... the equilibrium position so that the equilibrium position for the reaction with carbon monoxide so with carbon so let me write CO CO with carbon monoxide um, is shifted more towards the formation of the um, hemoglobin carbon monoxide complex, carbon monoxide complex. This indicates The hemoglobin, um, so hemoglobin, hemoglobin has a higher, has a high affinity for carbon monoxide, for CO. Yeah, so overall it tells us that like, you know, if you have, let's say, it pretty much means that when you have a presence of oxygen, for example, you have oxygen and you have carbon monoxide, uh, carbon monoxide will competitively be stronger. It's, it will bind to hemoglobin. That's it. That's all right. Question nine. A group of students was set the task of investigating the molar heat combustion of glucose using primary and secondary data that was obtained from two different experimental techniques. The first experiment technique used to find the molar heat combustion of glucose involved collecting primary data. The students set up the apparatus as shown below. They weighted out a sample of pure glucose powder into the crucible ready for the combustion. They also weighted 150 grams of water into the copper calorimeter pot and measured the initial temperature of the water. A very, very kind of, if you did VC, like if you do, you'll likely have done, um, for example, you would have, you would have done an experiment with um, calorimetry experiment like this. Uh, most of the time schools will do this. And yeah, it's a very nice experiment. So uh, before burning the glucose to determine experiment value of the heat content, the students decide to calculate the predicted maximum temperature rise of water. They set the data, so that the set data they used is shown. So we have the mass of the glucose powder, which is would be over here. So, okay, let me explain what this is. So you have um, this glucose, this glucose powder. They put it, and this is like an oven here, and they burn it. So when we're burning, it heats... It's going to be a combustion reaction. So what's going to be? Energy is going to be released. And when that, what we're saying is, well, we're, can, we're going to take the energy conservation to be conserved. Um, so all the energy is not going to be like, you know, going out, but going all into the water. And what's going to happen? Well, the water temperature will increase. And what we can use is then we can use MC delta T, so M cat, um, to find the energy of, of the water. Yeah, but that's when we're taking, again, that's when we're taking... Um, the law of conservation of energy. So it is a theoretical value. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, that's how the experiment is done. So what do we have? We have the mass of the glucose powder, mass of water, specific heat capacity, initial temperature of water, published molar heat combustion of glucose, and the molar mass of glucose. Okay. Use the data from table one to calculate the predicted maximum temperature of the water. Okay. So 
Three marks. Mm. Have a look at this. If I'm, no, so if we're taking the maximum temperature, we're talking about like, imagine that heat is not re like released. Let's say the maximum would be like all of the energy is pretty much put into the water. That is what we're taking. So we, when we're talking about the maximum temperature, in this case, we're going we're to, we're pretty much talking about um, the theoretical temperature, uh, the final temperature. So what we're going to do is, of course, well, the published molar heat combustion, which is this, we're going to write it down. So we have 2805 kilojoules per mole. That's the unit. I like to write the units to the right, like this, kilojoules per mole, meaning that kilojoules, if you divide an energy divided by moles, it will give us this. So knowing that, okay, I'm going to keep that there. All right. I also, what do I know? I know the mass of... Um, glucose powder, so the mass of, I'm going to write just glucose. The mass of glucose is what? 2.002 grams. Okay, and well, if we can find the molar mass of glucose and multiply it by this, we can get the kilojoules. That'll be useful. So, um, so let's do that. So we get the mole of glucose which will be 2.002 divided by the molar mass of glucose, which is uh, here, 180. And that's going to give us, well, let's use our calculator. So 2.002 divided by 180, uh, 0 0.0111. Okay, we'll write that in more. We have that, and then we're going to multiply it by this to get kilojoules of energy. So our energy times that by 2805, we get 31.197 kilojoules. So what we're saying is when we're burning this, we've pretty much released um, that much energy, the 31.197. One nine kilojoules, but because we're taking um, and what's gonna do? Because we're trying to find, we're taking you know the theoretical value, so it's gonna be all conserved. So all that energy is gonna go into here. So that energy over here is going to be we can put E A E is equal to M C delta T, where all the energy is going to the water, and so we can equate that. So thirty one will thirty one point one nine seven times ten to the power of three. We want to write it in joules is equal to mass um, of the water. So the mass of water is 150. The specific heat capacity of the water is 4.182. 4.182. And the change in temperature is going to be, well, we'll just leave it as change in temperature. And let's solve for that. So the change in temperature is going to be what? So first we're going to do is get this. I'm going to the power of 3 of that. So I'm going to take that. Divide it by 150 times 4.182. And I get uh, 49.73 degrees. Remember, the tangent temperature is equal to the final temperature minus the initial. And we already know that initial. The initial temperature of the water is 21.3. So, hence your final is going to be um, 49.7 plus 21.3, which is 71. So, what actually, um, what is the lowest? I think three decimal places, um, three significant figures. 71.0 degrees Celsius. Yeah. I hope that's great. <sighs> yeah, that's it. So what about this question over here? Um, the students then safely ignited the glucose powder. When the powder stopped burning, the students recorded the actual temperature rise of water. Mm -hmm. They determined that the final temperature of water was 48.5. So what's, so we the theoretical value is this, and the experimental value they've got is 48.5. Compare the experimental temperature 
rise with the value that the students predicted and hence comment on the accuracy of the value of the heat combustion of glucose that the students would have obtained using this experimental te technique. Okay, let's be honest, guys. If these values are not equal, telling us that it's not very accurate. This whole experiment is not very accurate. And it makes sense because remember, heat is going to be all outside. It's going to be like released. It's not, it's not insulated. It's, yeah, so of course not, it's not going to heat the water 100% to the maximum temperature as we said. So, okay, so let's first, it says compare the experimental temperature with the value that the students predicted. So the rise, temperature rise. So, okay, the temperature rise for the, in terms, well, for the um, periodical, so we write a T here, is what? Well, we got, um, it's this, 49 49.73 degrees and the the temperature rise for the experimental e in this case they got is 40 um but they determined that the final temperature is this so it's 48 this so what's 48.5 minus 21.3 it's 27.2 degrees celsius so can you see how okay yeah the temperature rise is very different what does this tell us there is a lack of of accuracy in this experimental so in the experimental technique it's not a very efficient so experimental technique okay um, so we can say yep uh, as this and this so and this will have and this will um, have a big impact so we'll have a big impact so this will have a big impact um, to the experimental to the ex experimental uh, heat combustion of glucose so heat combustion of glucose um, as this technique has many has many okay when we're talking about you know a accuracy a like a very low accuracy there's only two errors that are able to have that well remember, so for precision precision when when we when there is a low precision it's because of random errors but when it's accuracy there is a mix of random errors and systematic errors so we have to write also that so because the technique has many uh random and systematic errors. Errors occurring. And that is it. That's a nice way, yeah. Okay, the second experiment technique for finding the molar heat combustion of glucose involved using a typical commercial bomb cal calorimeter. The apparatus set up is, uh, you know, set up by the students as shown. Okay, this is, okay, if you, uh, it ca this uh, bump calorimeter is much more efficient because, again, it's more, as you can see, it is um, insulated, so it, most of all the energy is going to go into the um, the glucose powder in here. And what else do we see? Well, we also stir it up, so all of the dissolved gluco um, glucose powder is going to go into also. And we're also using pure oxygen and excess, so there's not going to be... Um, that the good thing is there isn't going to be an incomplete combustion because we're using pure oxygen in excess and we're excess. Remember, when we have excess, not limited. When we have limited, it's incomplete combustion, but we're putting excess pure oxygen. Hence, we are like pushing great values. We're trying to like make this so efficient. And yeah, the students were able to obtain the following second data from a commercial food analysis laboratory. So we have the current, potential difference, time pass, temperature of water, and the combustion of glucose, so the mass of the glucose, and the temperature rise. Okay? Show you by calculations that the calibration factor of the bump calorimeter obtained by the student is this. Nice and easy. Use your formula sheet. So if you, for CF, which is this over here, we want the uh, calibration factor. So let's write that formula. So it's going to be... CF is equal to V, the voltage current time over the change in temperature. So, let's do that. So, what is our voltage in our case? Our voltage is here, so 5.65. 5.65 uh, 
um, current, current's 1.78, time 135, and that's all divided by the temperature change, which is what? So the temperature rise of the water goes by 1.15, so 1.150, and this should give us a CF. Let's do that in our calculator. Does it give us the value? 5.65 times 1 1.78, 1.35, 1.150. And that gives me, yes, 1180 degrees Celsius. Pretty much the same calibration factor. Using this calibration factor of the bump calorimeter, calculate the molar heat combustion of glucose in joules per mole. Look at the unit. So we want joules per mole. So, so we're going to need the joules per mole. We're going to need, it means that we're going to need energy and we're going to divide that by the mole of glucose to get the molar heat combustion. So how do we get the energy? Well, have a look at this um, over here. If you look at that one, um, if you look at the units of this, so 1180 joules per degree. So this is degree Celsius. So in terms of um, degree Celsius, so temperature, what is it telling us? It's telling us if you times the temperature, for for example, here it's temperature because degree Celsius is temperature. In degree Celsius, so the temperature, by this we get the joules. And what is that temperature? Well, it's here. The temperature rise of the water is 17.32. We can say it's 17.32. You see how you can use the units to kind of make the um, formulas? And that's what I'm just doing. I don't even know those formulas yet. And so multiplying those together, we get um, so 17 point, yeah, it was 17.32. We get our joules. So our energy is 20 point, sorry, 20448.06 joules. And what about the mole? We need to also get that mole of glucose. Now, we luckily have the mass, so it's very easy. So mole of glucose is going to be mass, which is 1.324. So 1.324, all divided by... So one point. 3 to 4 divided by the molar mass, which if we go back to the original quotient, the molar mass of glucose is 180. So 180. Okay, so that's going to give us... Let me just... Before I take this off, I want to write all the numbers. So yeah, okay. So 1.324... What about 180? And that gives us the mass, uh, the N of glucose, so the mole, uh, the mole, which is 0 0.0073 mole. And hence, we have the energy, we divide it by the mole, and we're going to get the molar heat combustion. So your molar heat, I'm not going to just write, oh, yeah, I'm just going to, hence, your molar heat combustion, so your change in H, it's going to be your joules, so 2, 0, 448.0673 all divided by 0 0.0073. So 2048.0673 divided by the answer. And we get, remember, make sure you put a negative because remember, it is the change. It's that molar heat, it has to be a negative. Um, because it's a combustion reaction. So negative, we, well, we want to make sure we have four standard, four calculation, we did, the lowest we went was four. So three, so we're going to just do a three. So um, 2.78 times 10 to the power of one, two, three, four, five, six, six um, joules per mole. Okay, that is our molar heat combustion. Nice. Compare the experimental value from part BII with the published value of the molar heat combustion. So if we go to the um, 
Where's that? So the published model heat combustion is that. 28055. Ah, they're very, very close to each other. Very, very close. So this is 2.78, and the other one was um, 2805. Very close. So what is that? What can we say? Um, we can say um, the experiment, so compare the experimental value, um, value of this. Well, we just say, okay, we can say that the experiment, the experiment, experiment is very accurate, is very accurate as how much, so let's look at it in terms of potential, if I deck this divided by the real value in terms of by 100, but so and that will give us how much like precise it is, so that divided by, go up, Um, so 2805 times 10 to the power of 3 and times it all by 100 we get 99.1% so it is accurate so the experiment is very accurate giving us a 99% level of accuracy of accuracy so the experiment is very accurate giving us a 99 um, level of accuracy close to the true value close to the true value. It's very, very efficient, this method. So compare the experiment with the published value of the heat. Um, as, yeah, I think that's it. Would you say compare the experimental value with the published value of the molar heat combustion of the given? Yes, so the experiment is very um, accurate, giving us a 99% level of accurate close to the true value. So uh, let me just, both, of the molar heat combustion combustions are very close to each other are very close to each other that's it i think yeah oh ci so what does it say i developed one of the design faults of experimental technique one so that the first one that would have contributed to the less accurate results of course look at the first one we have no insulation so most of the heat could have just left and also we if you look at it it could have actually also had um it's not like the other one where we put excess pure oxygen here we're not putting pure oxygen we're it's like we're letting, it, we, we're probably putting like a limited supply, limit, a limited supply. So an incomplete combustion could have occurred too. So that is probably a problem with that one. So we can say, um, let's give two actually. It says one, but uh, two things that you are always a very, uh, a very simple answer. You could say is just um, incomplete combustion could have had, so incomplete combustion could have happened. And also heat loss to the surrounding because it's not insulated. Heat loss to the surroundings. And that's it. Um, what about II? So explain how the design features of the experimental technique two overcame the design faults identified in part C I I to obtain a more accurate results. Okay. First of all, they use pure oxygen. The second experiment used pure oxygen. This will make sure that we 100% get a complete combustion because remember, he's putting pure oxygen, but in excess. He's putting that, so it will fix the incomplete combustion. So we're 100% making sure that is complete combustion. Um, yeah, whereas also in terms of heat loss, again, it is also insulated. As you can see, it's also insulated, which fixes the um, heat loss to the surroundings. So we have a lot of stuff we can, yeah, just two dot points, let's do that. So we can say, um, pure oxygen, so pure oxygen is used in excess, is in excess, um, which will make sure it's a complete combustion. Combustion. That's it. Uh, whereas the other one, also, um, we can talk about um, the calor. 
so calorimeter is insulated is um, insulated to minimize heat loss heat loss uh, ensuring greater transfer of energy greater transfer of energy to the water to of the energy to the water wow i'm very tired wow this is a very long exam okay last question and it is a wow it's very long okay let's smash this question as quickly as we can all right so for the uh, for his extended VC chemistry experimental investigation project, Cruz decides to investigate whether there is a relationship between the rate of reaction uh, between magnesium and the hydrochloric acid HCl and the concentration of the acid. And the following is an extract for the scientific poster that Chris produced. Question on the investigation: Is there a relationship between the rate of reaction between the magnesium and the different concentration of hydrochloric acid? So equations for the reactions is this experimental design. Four different concentrations of HCl were tested. The rate of each reaction was investigated by measuring the volume of hydrogen gas produced. So, okay, well, let's just look at this. Um, so he's using four different concentrations. So this is going to be your, so the concentration of HCl is going to be your deep, uh, independent variable because the things, it's the thing that we change. And what we are measuring is the volume of hydrogen gas produced. And that hydrogen gas produced is our dependent variable. Hypothesis, the greater the concentration of acids, the faster the reaction will be. So he's saying the faster the concentration of the acid, so higher 2H, so the more it is, the greater he's saying um, the reaction will be. I expect because for the reaction to occur, H ions must collide with the magnesium ions. The atoms, the greater the concentration of acid, the more frequently the H ions will collide with the surface of the magnesium, and so the greater amount of h2 gas that will be true he's not wrong yeah that's absolutely true yeah, um that's the collision theory pretty much in his hypothesis does chris demonstrate an understanding of the chemistry that is relevant to the experimental experimental investigation um yes he absolutely does i think he actually has <laughs> he like you know so he, he so chris possesses so chris Possessive, we can say, we will write something why he's good at it. So, Chris, possessive, um, a basic understanding of the collision theory. Of the collision theory. Um, yeah, so that's good. But, However, he needs to also, that's what I'm saying, he, he has a basic understanding, he, because he's saying that if they collide, they, you know, you know, the, so what he's saying is the more frequently they will collide with the surface and this will create a greater H2 gas. He needs to also remember that that's not 100% sure because it needs, it depends on the orientation. So remember, he needs to look at factors, for example, for... Um, for the collision theory, you need to remember, we need to look at that factors, for example, collision geometry. And is the activation energy for the collision, you know, is there enough for the collision to be successful? So he hasn't actually took those in to, you know, four. So just some, like, because two marks, I think he's done a great job. But because it's two marks, you want to say something that he did great. He knows a basic understanding, but also he, he looked, um, however, so we'll say, however, he overlooks, however... He overlooks, overlooks, um, so he overlooks uh, crucial factors, so crucial factors uh, of the correct, of the correct collision, so collision geometry. And activation energy. For, so wait, sorry, wait. Energy for a collision, for a collision to be successful. Yeah, so I think, yeah, Crispus says a basic understanding of the, the collision theory. However, he overlooks crucial factors such as collision 
collision geometry and activation engine for the collision to be successful. So he hasn't looked at that also. Um, there's many things you can write, I'm not going to lie. So there's quite a lot you can look at. In his poster, Chris outlined how the experimental investigation was conducted and extract for his methodology is shown in the table here. Um, okay, what do we see? First, the variables were identified, the decision are, okay, I made, are shown. So the mass of magnesium is the control. So the first, so the first piece of uh, magnesium ribbon was weighted and measured from the then the same length of magnesium once used for each concentration of HCl. Okay, that's great. Concentration of HCl, dependent variable. No, 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 no. He's made a mistake here. Have a look at this. It's not the dependent variable. It's the independent. He's remember he's he's changing the um, concentration of HCl, as you can see, to test. The, independent, the dependent variable, which is the volume of HCl. So what he's done is he's confused. Um, well, he's not. It's not the control variable. So this one over here is supposed to be the independent. This one here is supposed to be the independent, and this one over here is supposed to be the dependent. Uh, the volume is going to be the dependent variable. He's just kind of mixed those up. So, so 500 ml was used for each test, measured using a graduated measuring cylinder. Okay. Is Chris's identification of the concentration of HCl as the dependent variable correct? No, 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 no. Conce look at that, like we corrected a concentration of HCl. So, uh, Chris is wrong. The, I'm gonna write this. So, H concentration of HCl is the independent variable. Nice. Chris Poster included a diagram of the experimental setup, supposed by short nose as shown. Okay, makes sense. So he has this piece of magnesium. Okay, he has these nicely pieces of magnesium that are equal in length, and he's put a magnetic stirrer to keep the reactants evenly. Yep, sealed the reaction flask. That's great. Syringe to make sure um, how much he wants to put. H2 gas collecting in graduated measuring cylinder, stopwatch, tablet used to record results. That's great. Notes. Timing began the instant I started injecting the acid from the syringe above the flask onto the piece of magnesium. The stopwatch was mounted next to the graduate measuring cylinder and the volume and the time were recorded using a video app on a tablet device and replayed in slow motion to allow results to be attained. That's actually a good way. He's used a tablet and he can slow down to see, uh, to be more precise, to be more accurate in a way. Um, the injection of the 20 milliliters of HCl into the sealed reaction flask immediately pushed 20 milliliters of air out of the flask and into the measuring cylinder, I recorded only the net volume of H2 gas produced. Okay. Identify one feature of uh, Chris's experimental setup and notes above that was designed to improve the accuracy of the results. Explain how this feature could improve accuracy. Yeah, we can talk about how he has this tablet. He's put actually um, an extra tablet. So he's put a tablet, which was not in the methodology, but he's put a tablet, which... He can slow down, so that can also, um, it's, a, it's a very good thing. He can, yeah, so we can talk about, identify one feature, so let's identify, and then we'll explain how this feature improves accuracy. So the tablet, what is it? So the tablet, the tablet enhances accuracy by minimizing human error pretty much because if he was like uh, measuring it um, he would have made human error whereas he can slow it down to the perfect so human error associated um, simultaneously looking at both variables so recording gas volume so recording gas volume so it Gas volume and time. That's the great thing about it. Um, also, you know, Chris can pause uh, the video to precisely record the data for both gas and um, at any point of the experiment. So this approach pretty much, what's the good thing about this approach is it improves the accuracy, um, resulting in data that he's going to get that are closer aligns to the real values, the actual values. So that's the good thing he's done here. But it's free Mark's way. Wow, we need to write actually a lot more than that. So let's talk about, so Chris can also pause. So Chris can pause the video. We said that Chris can pause the video to precisely record data 
for both gas gas volume and time at any point at any time so at any point great we can you can also um so again this whole approach so this approach aims to improve accuracy to improve accuracy resulting in the data measured in the data measured to be close to be close to the actual values wow i know i'm quite rushing this uh, chris also observed this observation in his poster so observations for the 2.0 hydrochloric um so i said initially there was a very rapid bubbling in the flask okay the bubbling slowed over time all magnesium appeared to have dissolved the flask became very hot ah so let's really understand what's happening there's a very rapid bubbling so if there is bubbles it means that Again, remember going from back, we saw that hyd so hydrogen gas is being produced. The bubbling slowed over time, all magnesium appeared to have dissolved. So if all of the magnesium appeared to dissolve, that's great. So it's a complete, com in other words, it's a complete combustion. Um, the flask became very hot. Yes, this tells us that it's exothermic. That's also great to know. So that's telling us that, let me just number those off. This is also telling us that it's exothermic. For the 1.5 and 1.0 hydrochloric acid solution, the bubbling was not as rapid as for the 2.0 hydrochloric acid. Um, and for the 0.5 hydrochloric, it was much slower. The solution was still bubbling when timing stopped. The, the This flask became hot over as not as hot the, as the flask containing the 2.0 uh, hydrochloric acid. Um, so comment on the crit's observation, including the differences in the rate of bubbling and how will the experiment have been controlled okay well we can say as we saw what does the rate of bubbling do well the rate of bubbling reflects the rate of the hydrogen gas production and so in other words the, if there's more hydrogen gas being produced so example as we in, what he's saying is because remember we're measuring the rate of the rate so the rate of bubbling for example we said the rate of bubbling reflects the rate of hydrogen gas production. So as the rate of is so as this rate is proportional to the con concentration of hydrochloric acid. Yes, so the more as you see the more concentration we increase the more bubbling we get hence showing us that it is there is actually a relationship between the rate of production of hydrogen gas and the concentration of hydrochloric acid. That's good. Um okay. What else can we do? It says the bubbling of Sovita, all the magnetic salt became hot. The bubbling was not as rapid for the surrounding muscles. So if the solution was still bubbling, um, okay, the flask became hot. Okay, and we also, what about, okay, why is the glass hot? Well, the flask became hot because this indicates an exothermic reaction. We can write that. What else can we talk about? Um, so again we can also talk about the reaction has gone to completion because all the magnesium had been dissolved again um also we need to talk about how well the experiment had been controlled so chris did a great job with the mass of magnesium why because remember when he cut them equal um equally what does this tell us he's created a control group for the surface area remember if he's cutting them nicely um all equal length all of them have the same surface area that's good um and we can maybe one more thing we can talk about a, a improvement he can make what improvement can he make yeah another improvement that he can take is for example the syringe for injecting hydrochloric acid he can actually change that why don't he just use a pipette it will make the volume so the amount of volume that he pushes down or much more um accurate so let's write all of that down so first thing we're going to write down is okay we said that the rate of bubbling we said that the rate of bubbling, so the rate of bubbling reflects the rate of H2 gas production. Okay, so, so as the reaction rate, so the reaction rate is proportional 
to the concentration of high of HCl, so hydrochloric acid. That's what we said. Also, we talked about. Let me just use a different color. We can. We also talk about that the flask, the flask, became hot. Became hot, meaning an exothermic exothermic reaction happened. Uh, what else can we talk about? We'll, we did talk about, okay, also that the reaction, the reaction has gone to completion because the magnesium all, so the reaction has gone to completion. All magnesium had been consumed. Had been consumed. We can also, what else we talked about? Well, um, now let's talk about Chris. So again, so we said Chris did a great job because he cut them all in equal length. So all of them have the same surface area. So Chris did a great job, great job as he, um, so what did he say? As he cut, the magnesium equal length, equal length, meaning he controlled, he controlled, so meaning that he controlled the surface area. I know I'm writing a lot, but I want to write whatever that comes to my mind so you guys can maybe um, see if you guys have the same. You guys just need, I think, just three at this point. Just make sure, yeah, I'm writing. So, and we also talked about, okay, what is a good thing he can also um, do great on? He can, so, also replace the, what was it? Um, um, so, he can replace the measuring cylinder. So, replace measuring cylinder with pipette. I know I'm writing a lot, so with pipette for more accurate result, more accurate. That's it. I mean, I mean, I know I've written a lot. You don't need that much, but yeah, that, that should be enough. Chris uh, replayed his video in slow motion, recorded his experimental result in a logbook, and produced this graph for his poster. Well, what can we see? Well, um, so the volume of gas produced, the time, and we also have all the concentration of HCl. So what do we see? Well. His hypothesis is true. He did say about, um, for example, low concentration. As um, time progresses, the volume increases. But the more you increase the um, concentration, it will become more greater, the more production. But that's initially. And then it becomes normal. So, yeah, he's, he had a great um, hypothesis there. So let's look at this. So what conclusions might Chris have stated given the results for this question under investigation and his hypothesis? Remember, okay, he could say that in his hypothesis that, that the greater, so you would have said something like the greater the concentration. So when he sees that, he says that the greater the concentration of HCl, um, the... So that's his clue. So the greater, so greater the initial, the initial um, rate of reaction, rate of reaction. Remember that the rate of reaction is the amount of bubbling that's happening. So hence, we can talk about hence. There is a relationship. There is a relationship. Between concentration of HCO and production of H2 gas. So yeah, he had a great um, hypothesis and he did great on it. F, so just one other question Chris could ask to extend the experimental investigation and briefly outline an experiment design that would enable Chris to answer this question. You may present an answer at least of main steps or a simple flowchart. Okay, three marks. Okay, I'm gonna, let's think. 
what, heck, what, what else can he ask? Well, what about if the most, I think the most basic is, you know the piece of magnesium? What about if he's like, a, a question that he could ask is, how does surface area of magnesium affect the rate of reaction? Because, you know what he can just use? He can use this whole thing again, his whole setup, but just um, not use now, not, they, they, now the independent independent variable is going to change. It's not, it's going to be HCl, but let's say one mole of HCl. It's a, it's a control variable now. We'll leave it as control variable. And yeah, now the different is the magnesium. For example, we get a magnesium that's a full block. The next one is half cut. Uh, the next one is like four times cut. That one's eight times cut, 16 cuts. We do like four samples and the more it's cut, so the surface area is getting lower and see how reaction rate is um, being, you know, uh, that's a good question, yeah. Because you know why? There's many you can do. You can also maybe there's so many research questions like how does temperature um, affect the reaction rate? Like, but then you have to think about other stuff. For example, you would have to talk about a thermometer and all. But I think the most easiest thing you can do here is how does surface area affect magnesium? Let's write that. So a research question that we can ask. Research. So research question is how does does magnesium uh, so how does magnesium so sorry how does the surface area of magnesium the surface area of magnesium so the surface area of magnesium affect the reaction rate all right that's a question he can ask and then let's just identify the independent and dependent variable so to get more marks so that should give you a mark so okay independent variable is the thing that we're going to change and that's the surface area so 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 let's do so surface area of mg the magnesium that's uh, what about your dependent variable? So what are we measuring dependent variable? Well, the dependent variable in this case is going to be the hydrogen gas that's being produced. Remember, it is, remember hydrogen gas, the more, it, it, it's, it tells us about the reaction, right? So again, same thing. So volume of H2 produced, H2 gas produced. Um, what about the controlled? In terms of control variable, well, of course, the mass of mg for all of them. We want the mass to be the same, but the length to be different. So mg, wait, mass of mg. Um, again, concentration. So, well, one mole of HCl. So the concentration has to be the same. Um, yeah, like mass, concentration. Yeah, that, that, I think those are, uh, also, yeah, mass. Also, volume of HCl also is a good one. Let's see, yeah, I don't think you need a lot. We got that, and also, and what about, let's, let's write a methodology. Because the thing about methodology is it's the same as we, it's pretty much the same, but there's only a little bit differences. Myth of the one he did, so methodology. So what we can just say is, like, use a, so the first thing we can say is this, so use a uh, one more, so use one mole of HCl, we can say, so we can also say set up apparatus, apparatus um, as from previous question, as from previous question, so previous experiment actually, because we're going to be using the same everything, but the difference is we're now using one mole of HCl. Um, what we're going to do is then also cut, we're going to cut, um, we'll, we'll actually, we'll cut five pieces of magnesium of equal length. And then we'll place the first one, place first mg in a conical flask, in a conical flask, and we'll call that one. Um, and pretty much do that for the same thing. So like place um, 
to the second magnesium in conical fast two, blah blah blah, and just like you know, make sure to have them. And then what we can say, and but make sure, um, the next one. So for example, the place the second magnesium, magnesium, but make sure it's cut like in four pieces or eight pieces, and the and then the se the second the third conical fast is like sixteen pieces. Then the other, so and we want to make sure that the five charts they start increasing. Um, surface area and yeah then blah 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 so like six seven eight right there i'm not gonna write it because it's quite late now and then we're gonna say um also run we're gonna just say yeah run each trial um by adding by adding 20 milliliters of one more of h of of <sighs> wow of HCl each time. I'm very tired. I'm not gonna lie. So I think that'll be enough. So run each trial by adding 200 ml acid and record experiment and record um, H2 gas produced. H2 gas produced, and that's it. Um, I think that will be enough for this. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you learned something for this video. If you guys want other videos like this, please make sure to like and subscribe and share this video with your friends. Uh, thank you guys for watching and have a great day. Bye-bye.